The Send Local Offer is a website containing information and support for children and young people aged 0 to 25 within the Nottinghamshire area who have special educational needs or disabilities. The Local Offer is like a hub of all information, everything put together on one page. It's really useful for special educational needs and it's Nottinghamshire and surrounding counties so even if you're bordering on the county you can still find useful information. I use the website to look for things to do with my hobbies, such as performing arts activities and areas where I can voice my opinion. You can find lots of useful information on the youth zone for young people. For example, health, education, finding a job and hobbies and interests. There's absolutely loads of information. There's health, education, social care, clubs, transport. It's all there. You might want to use the local offer to see how you can get some extra support for your child at school, apply for a short break or just simply see what clubs or activities are available in the local area. Even if you don't know what you're looking for, it's worth just having a look on there because there's so much information available. We've used the local offer quite a lot over the years. It's been really useful for the girls. When we needed to apply for an educational health care plan for our son, uh, we went online and looked at the local offer so we understood the process from start to finish and what steps we needed to take. If you are a young person with special educational needs or disabilities living in Nottinghamshire, I would say give the young people them a try. There is lots of information and you can get involved by sending an article, a blog or a vlog. I think the local offer is a really useful resource for parents and carers living within Nottinghamshire. It's a comprehensive hub of information and I found out about support and services that I wouldn't have otherwise known about.
My name's Eddie Moorcroft. I've had support from the social services because I have a learning disability and they've supported me to live independently and to stay healthy and safe. That part of the way I live. Being part of co-production is meeting new people. New people who have a different way of thinking to you maybe and understanding their thoughts and their feelings. Um, I've been involved in training staff. Uh, I've been involved with interviewing for senior staff at Notts County Council to make sure that the people who we hire actually do understand what we need and what we want. It means I'm listened to. It means I can make a difference because I wanted to make change. Um, a lot of things, I didn't understand a lot of things. I didn't understand the way things were working. And I wanted to have more control of my life. And other people were controlling it by telling me what I can and can't do. And I was like, if I understood more, I could take that control. It makes you think, yes can do it and then you start to think how far can I push this what's next okay I've done that but where do I go to next
Ladies and gentlemen, please can I remind you to ensure mobile phones and other devices are on silent, that banners are not permitted and members of the public are not allowed to address the meeting, to use the microphones which are available when addressing the meeting and that you may be filmed or recorded during this meeting. Thank you. Please be upstanding for your chairman. Chairman, we're ready. So let's take a, a moment just now to, to settle down to the business of the day. And as we gather from across the county, we give thanks once more for the opportunity to serve, to serve the whole county and its people. We ask the Lord's help to act with real character and conviction so that he will help us to listen to each other carefully. With greater understanding and goodwill. For we know that he will help us to speak with charity and with restraint. May the Lord give us the spirit of service and remind us that we are stewards of his authority. May he guide us to be good leaders, the kind of leaders his people need and deserve. Help us to see the humanity and dignity of those who disagree with us, and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with reverence his creation deserves. And we ask you, Father, to renew us with the strength of your presence and with the joy of helping to build up a community worthy of the human person. And we ask this as your sons and daughters, confident in your goodness and love, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Chair. Sorry? No, mine's off. <laughs> right, agenda item one, uh, <coughs> members, is to approve the uh, minutes of the last meeting. Could we, uh, by a show of hands, show approval of the minutes? All those in favour? That is clearly carried. Item two is apologies for absence. First of all, Councillor Barnfather, do you have any apologies? Uh, uh, yes, uh, Chairman, sorry. Uh, Councillor Bailey uh, will be joining us shortly. I believe he's held up in the um, uh, traffic confusion caused by the closure of the M1. Thank you. Councillor Henry. Uh, Councillor Henry, um, um, Councillor Henry has sent his apologies. Uh, oh, from the Labour group, we have uh, apologies from Councillor Allen, Councillor Callaghan, Councillor Henry, all for medical reasons. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Deakin. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Apologies, Councillor Deakin and Councillors 
uh, Francis Perdue and Horan are both put apologies for medical reasons, and Councillor Shaw is running late this evening also for medical reasons. Thank you. That's a good start. And we also have an apology for absence from Councillor Stephen Garner, who is on other county council business. Uh, can I just say that the audio is not working for people watching at home? I don't know if somebody can remedy that. Thank you. Thank you. We'll pause for a moment while we try and sort that out. All right, uh, members, if we can, uh, can, can continue, I've been told that it should be working. Uh, if anybody gets a, a text or a message saying that uh, it's, it still isn't, would they let me know immediately and then we'll make sure our techni technical experts have another look at it. Uh, Andrew, under item three, then, declarations of interest. If any councillor or officer has either a disclosable pecuniary interest or a private interest in any matter on the agenda, you should declare it now. Please raise your hand now if you have an interest to declare. And when called to speak, you should state whether it is a disclosable pecuniary interest or a private interest and give brief details. No one? No one. Agenda item four, then, is uh, Chairman's Business. And the first item uh, on <coughs> my business is to offer congratulations to all those from Nottinghamshire who have received nominations in the Queen's New Year's Honours list. And in particular, I'd like to congratulate Councillor John Clark on being awarded an MB for his services to local government uh, in Nottinghamshire. And also Charlotte Henshaw, daughter of Councillor Paul Henshaw, on her MBE, for services to canoeing. And any member would like to comment or make a, uh, uh, say a few words about those two uh, uh, members? Uh, that, sorry, that member and, and the, the daughter of uh, one of our members, then uh, please uh, indicate and uh, I will call you in order. Uh, Councillor Payne. Councillor Fold, you're next. Thank you very much, um, Mr Chairman. Can I associate myself with the comments you made about both Councillor John Clark, who I think has served with distinction for 30 years uh, on Gedlinborough Council and also nearly a quarter of a century here in, in, in this chamber, as well as holding various other roles, chairing the police authority and um, ably serving a number of governing bodies at schools and many other things. So uh, congratulations to, to, to John and to uh, Charlotte for her achievements as well. And, and can I just also, while I'm on my feet, Mr Chairman, uh, which I know you will want to support with the role that you have played on the fire authority. Congratulate our Chief Fire Officer John Buckley on his Queen's Fire Service Medal. He served with the fire service since 1996 in Nottinghamshire. He's been our Chief since 2014 and he will be officially retiring in April 2022. He was not only recognised for the distinguished services given for our county uh, and our city throughout his time at the fire service, but also for the outstanding work, Mr Chairman, that you're aware of that he's done for the firefighters charity uh, and his national lead on the National Fire Chiefs uh, Council. So I'm sure I speak on behalf of everybody and certainly yourself, Mr Chairman, when I say congratulations to our Chief Fire Officer John Buckley on his Queen's Fire Service Medal. Thank you, Councillor Payne. I'd certainly like to be associated with those comments about John Buckley having served on the Fire Authority, as you quite rightly said. Uh, next, I have Councillor Pohl. 
<laughs> yes, thank you, Chairman. Yes, and me, and me too. Um, many congratulations to John for being awarded the Queen's Fire Service Medal. And I know um, uh, Michael knows much better than I do, but many congratulations from the Labour Group. Um, clearly, his service was, was, was exceptional. Um, okay, so I'd like to speak about both John, John and, Sh and Charlotte, if that's okay. Um, <clears throat> first, many congratulations, John, for your award, for your very long and distinguished service to local government in Nottinghamshire. And on behalf of the Labour Group, thank you for your hard work over many years, and I know you'll continue to be with the boys. It's great to have you in the group. Your dedication and commitment to the people of Netherfield and Colic, Gedlingborough and Nottinghamshire has been outstanding. The work to transform the former Gedling Colliery into Country Park is just one example. It's a great example, but it's just one example of many. A great achievement and one that will benefit generations to come. And you had other roles as well, as chairman of the Police and Crime Panel after being chair of the Police Authority for 10 years, where you're recognised as a fierce advocate of neighbourhood policing. And I think I remember coming to you with a parking ticket on one occasion. Oh, yeah, I don't think of, which you really very, kind, very kindly listened to. So on behalf of the Labour Group, many congratulations um, to your richly deserved MBE. And this honour recognises your passion and your enthusiasm for your work in the community and as a dedicated public servant. Done, John. If I could just say something about Charlotte too. Um, and it was just great to see Charlotte's name in the 2022 20, New Year's yeah. Honours. I mean, since, since being the age of just four, swimming has been very big in Charlotte's life. And during her swimming career, she's represented Great Britain in 2010, 2013 and 2015 World Championships. <coughs> <coughs> At the 2008 um, Beijing Paralympics, the 2012 Summer Olympics and the 2016 Paralympics in Rio de Janeiro. Then won a silver medal at the London Games, followed by a bronze in Rio de Janeiro. Then felt she was ready to take on a new challenge, for goodness sake. And in Charlene's words, after spending so many years doing one sport, it's refreshing and exciting to be able to push myself in a completely different way. So she did. Blimey, did she. In early 2017, Charlotte announced her retirement from swimming to become a competitive, par competitive paracanoeist. She started canoe training in late 2016, made her international debut at the European Championships in Bulgaria, winning a silver medal, and then went on to compete successfully in the World Championships in the Czech Republic during 2017. The list of Charlotte, uh, Charlotte's achievements is absolutely endless, I and mean, I could, could go on for an awful long time. And she's even got a swimming pool named after her. In 2014, the District Council, after acknowledging the achievements of Ollie Hind, named the Pool uh, Towns Water Sports Meadows Complex, the Hines and Henshaw Competition Pool, to honour Ollie and, and Charlotte, who all trained there, and uh, Ollie's brother Sam. Paul, I know you're very proud. You must be very proud. And I know you've made a fantastic contribution, you and your family, to, 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 support, to, to support Charlotte. So please pass on many congratulations and good luck in the future to Charlotte from both myself and the Labour Group. We are all so proud of what she has and is continuing to do for the community of Mansfield in Great Britain. Thank you. Yeah, okay, okay, that's great. Councillor Henshaw. <laughs> Uh, Councillor Quigley and uh, fellow members, firstly, um, I would like to congratulate John, a uh, comrade and uh, friend, for his uh, uh, accolade that he's just received. Um, much deserved. Uh, when, when Radio Mansfield rang me up about um, the, the problems that's going off in the Conservative Party, I made a comment and I said... Um, I've had the privilege and the honour to work with people, uh, men and women, of all political persuasions who have dedicated their lives to serve their communities, <laughs> irrespective of party politics or personal gain. And John is such an example. He is exemplary in his dedication and his service to the people of his community and to the people of Nottinghamshire. So I'll, now I'll move on to mentioning a little bit about my daughter who has received this accolade, an MBE. Sometimes it's very difficult when you have a child or a child is born with a disability and right from an early age, uh, I knew, I could see that Charlotte had determination and in whatever she did, I knew she would be dedicated and she would try and achieve as much 
as she could. That transcribed, she actually learned to swim before she could walk. And that transcribed through a very good and esteemed swimming career. But when, after the Rio Paralympics, British swimming in their wisdom decided to cut the funding to anybody that hadn't got a gold medal, or Charlotte got a bronze, uh, it didn't set a bank. She said, I need to do something else. I want to stop in elite sport. So she tried various different sports. And as it happened, when she went to home pier punt, to uh, practice canoeing, she, she gelled and clicked with it. Now, first thing, in relation to facilities and uh, sports facilities in particular that we as a county council have had some input in over the years, when it was decided to set up the National Water Sports Centre in Nottinghamshire, in retrospect, that was one of the best things that could happen. That facility is world-class and it's producing lots and lots of elite athletes. And not only that, it's a good facility for people to go and enjoy. In relation to um, Charlotte winning uh, her medals, it's the first time in Paralympic kayaking that a participant has been European, world and Paralympic champion and had a world record in the history of Paralympic kayaking. So from that perspective, it's brilliant. When she came to me and said, Dad, there might be an MBE in the offing, what do you think? <laughs> I said, well, Charlotte, if, if you want to take it, it's up to you. She said, Dad, I think I'm going to take it for this reason. I'm going to take it so that there will be recognition for not only women, in sport, but women who have a disability. And I said, good on you. If you go down there, it's going to be brilliant. But there's been lots of praise and lots of accolades. I know Charlotte is really pleased from the support she gets, not only from the county council, the district council, and other members of the community. Because she, I know she lives in Sutton, but she's a Mansfield lass. And uh, I'd just like to echo my thanks to everyone that supported it. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, just to put on record my um, congratulations, uh, as others have said, to Councillor Clark in the first instance um, for uh, services to local government. I don't think anyone can deny the longevity and the impact uh, that you have had on Gedling and on Nottinghamshire uh, a decade as, as leader of Gedling and 30 years uh, representing your community is uh, an incredible achievement in itself. Uh, so, uh, I mean, we can all hope to uh, emulate that longevity of service uh, and the impact that you have had. We're at the mercy of our constituents from that perspective, uh, but certainly shows a huge amount of dedication to your community and our community. Um, I've only been in this role a short time and our, our relationship has been um, uh, limited from that perspective. But I've always found uh, you to be a constructive influence and to be helpful in our conversations about collaboration, about working together across the county. And I hope that can continue. Uh, congratulations on your uh, honour, which is, is well deserved. Also like to uh, add my congratulations to, uh, to Charlotte Henshaw. And I hadn't realised until recently, Paul, that she was uh, your daughter. So she's done uh, well through even more adversity. Uh, <laughs> 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 but, so, no, no, I, I'm sure you're, you're incredibly proud. <laughs> right. um, I'm sure you're incredibly proud, uh, as we all are, of her uh, and people in Mansfield and around Nottinghamshire are of her achievements, um, not only as a, a gold medalist, but uh, as a representative of our communities. Um, what you said earlier about her reasons for wanting to accept the MBE uh, shows that kind of character um, that she is. And, uh, you know, uh, I think she is uh, and has become, will be for a long time, a, a a role model, uh, a hero to many people uh, across Mansfield, perhaps particularly young women, perhaps particularly uh, those with disabilities who um, might aspire to, to achieve and have been shown that that is possible and doable. So um, hugely proud uh, of uh, both John and Charlotte, as I'm sure we all are around the county. 
uh, and grateful for everything they've done for our communities. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Councillor Neil Clark. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, well, from one Councillor Clark MBE to another Councillor Clark MBE, uh, hearty congratulations. Uh, and I think uh, my dealings with uh, John has been more experienced as district council leaders uh, rather than on this council. Uh, so I've known uh, and dealt, uh, had friendly and pleasant dealings with John for many years. Uh, and no matter what the party colour is, uh, I, as far as I'm concerned, we've always had extremely friendly, uh, helpful and collaborative uh, discussions with each other uh, and John has put a lot of uh, good work into uh, the community and even on this council collaborating on things like the Gedling Access Road etc. So uh, we've always had, as I say, those very good relationships, uh, so uh, well deserved and um, if you're going to go to the big castle for your award, I can't help you, but if you're going to go to the big house for your award, I can give you some tips on uh, where the best places are to sit and the layout uh, for your family, etc. Uh, but anyway, hearty congratulations. Councillor Barnfather. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chairman. I'd uh, firstly like to associate myself with the uh, uh, remarks from uh, Councillor Fole in respect of uh, Charlotte. Uh, obviously, I don't know Charlotte, um, but um, the pride that she brings uh, in representing Nottinghamshire to all of us uh, as one of many, we are very blessed in this county with the number of, of excellent sports people that we seem to consistently produce, Charlotte being the latest one effectively uh, off the, out of the machine. And, and uh, you know, uh, you must be such a proud parent, uh, Paul. We're all proud parents of our children, whatever their achievements, large or small. Uh, and, and in your case, so, so very, very much to celebrate. And I congratulate you and, and Charlotte. Uh, I'd also like to associate myself with the remarks from uh, Councillor Payne in respect of John Buckley. Um, from my time on the uh, Fire Authority, uh, I always found John to be uh, extremely helpful to elected members never resented the role of the authority as, as the uh, oversight body uh, of his role. Um, uh, he was always professional, competent, a pleasure to work with, very, very supportive and a, a very worthy recipient of the Queen's uh, Award. Uh, but primarily I rise to speak in respect of Councillor John Clark. John and I have been fellow Gedling uh, elected members for 15 years. I'm only half the time, John, that you've been there, and I will never, ever match your, uh, your 30 years, nor aspire to do so. Uh, but we have enjoyed an excellent relationship at Gedling. I was fortunate enough to be leader of the opposition there. I, I'd sooner have been leader of the council, but I was fortunate enough <laughs> to be leader of the opposition there for 10 years during uh, uh, primarily John's time, uh, tenure as, as the leader. And we always enjoyed an excellent working relationship. We never let politics get in the way of a good personal relationship. John was always extremely courteous to me as a leader of the opposition and afforded any leader of the opposition the respect that they should be entitled to. Uh, and I thank you for that, John. I thank you for the fact that we worked so well together, along with Michael. Uh, on many, many occasions, uh, unlike some authorities, there was very little difference between us, some occasional ideological differences, but quite often it was the width of a fag packet between how the opposition worked and how the administration worked, largely down to, uh, to, to John's input and his style of leadership within the group at Gedlin Borough Council. I thank you for your friendship, John. I thank you for the way that we've worked together and hopefully we'll continue to work together in this and other chambers. Thank you. Councillor Cotty. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, Councillor John Clark. Known him um, all of my political life. Um, you're a gentleman. Yes, it's a long time. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> um, Very but well. congratulations, John, on, on the uh, award that you've received. Um, and I echo the words that have already been said. Um, and I wanted to take this opportunity as well to refer to Charlotte Henshaw, MBE. Um, I was lucky in my role at Nottinghamshire County Council to be involved at the beginning 
and I have always watched the people that we put through the program with support from others, of course. We're not the only people to support them. But uh, Paul, it's fantastic to see what she's achieved through her career. And I, when I read in detail what she's achieved, I was even more a wow factor. And to go to a sport and win the British Championship with a gold medal in 2008, then go through the sport and then find out to be, um, should we say dismissed because she didn't win a gold medal, and then have the determination to go, right, I'm going to go for another sport. And just to say that 2018 season, she won every competition that she went into. And, and it's, like, it's amazing from a para canoe to come through with all those medals. And not just any medal, gold. And then to see how she's carrying on through that and her determination. So on behalf of the, the Conservative group, I'd like you to take back to her our thanks, well done, and what a girl she is. Thank you. Councillor John Clark. Thanks, Mr Chairman, and uh, congratulations to Charlotte and to, to John as our fire chief who is retiring soon. Uh, for all their work and efforts. I'm quite overwhelmed, actually, because I normally like to get things done in the 60s in the background. Uh, a lot of people say, well, who did you... I think somebody said to me this morning, who did you lobby for that? Well, I didn't lobby for that. Um, I actually put, you know, 30, 40 years. Now, I take this back, and it's a warning to people. Don't join the Cubs, don't go in the Scouts, and don't be a school governor, because you end up doing this, and you get so besotted with the... Uh, you know, I'm not too... I'm, I, yeah, obviously, I sit in the Labour Party... But the politics sometimes gets in a way of getting things done in the community. I try to look at that first, and that's what I've wanted to do. And I think the clear recognition of that is the fact that the hundreds, hundreds of people that have been in touch with me, even Michael Gove wrote to me, um, you know, saying, well done, thank you, this, that, and the other, for all things. And when you speak to the Cabinet Office, and it is weird, well, do we take this award, do you not? They really put you through it. And I'm saying, well, you know, I'm quite humbled to take something like this because you are all part of it in Nottinghamshire County Council. And Gedling Council, particularly pleased for my family. But he said, no, what you've done and what other people have done needs recognising. And I spoke to two people in the Cabinet Office at two points. And I think we should, and I raised it with um, Kate here now, uh, that we do recognise here. We haven't even got a board up for somebody's service. Just to, that we, you know, we're proud of our heritage in this country and we should make sure it's written down and so other people can read into it. And even if there's a book or there's something that gives a history, and I'm thinking we're going to say something about Maureen soon. And Vince, who was, you know, a, 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 another good person, Vince, uh, who came on here and worked his socks off. And he has many other people. But where is it? There's no real recognition. There's a few pictures of chairs around, that type of thing. I think we should recognise that. We should also talk to ministers of whatever persuasion, parties of whatever persuasion. We are actually the engine room. We are the engine room. They do it. We take all the stick. It was nice getting all these emails because normally the bins have been missed or something like that. Yeah. All that road's closing. And if anybody's been along Mappy Top the next, few, the next week or two, it's going to be closed while we do some work there. That would be bombarding us. But we do that and we care passionately. We have a row in here. We go out and hopefully we go. Chris and I have had plenty of rows, but we're going to have a beer as soon as we get anywhere. And it's stiff of a bar. That's <laughs> it. We'll go and do it. But thank you very, very much. It's really appreciated. <laughs> Right, we have one award this morning, and that is for COVID-19 Outstanding Response Award. And could I ask Councillor Boyd Elliott to introduce the award, please? Thank you, Chairman. I am delighted to inform you today that Nottingham County Council Procurement Team was awarded the COVID-19 Outstanding Response Award for their work on sourcing and providing personal protective equipment, PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic. This demonstrates their continued outstanding approach to procurement, despite the very challenging circumstances of COVID-19. The Government Office awards recognise excellence in public procurement. Receiving the award acknowledges the amazing efforts that our procurement team, in collaboration with public health, health and safety and facilities, have all put in to maintain PPE provision through these challenging times. Everyone involved has gone the extra mile 
to ensure the seamless delivery of millions of PPP items across Nottingham and Nottinghamshire. The staff and services delivering critical care since the beginning of COVID-19 pandemic, although PPE supply chains are now much more stable, our procurement team continues to go above and beyond to support source items that are not widely available, ensuring the PPE provision is never interrupted. Our colleagues across the council in procurement, public health, health and safety and those working in the warehouse and transporting the supplies around the county should feel rightly proud of themselves. And I'm delighted their efforts have been recognised with this award. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor uh, Elliot. Uh, the hard work and dedication of our staff to deliver the millions of PP items needed across Nottingham and Nottinghamshire during the pandemic is something we should be very proud of in this chamber. And I'm so pleased that their work has been nationally recognised with this award. Kej Gatahora, Dean Sutherland, James Silverstone, Helen Lester, Andrea Bell, Lucy Fox, Lorraine Dennis, Stephanie Chadwick, Angela Howard, and Jeff Hamilton representing the various teams involved in the delivery of PPE are waiting in the wings. I will now invite them to join me, along with Councillor Elliott, to present the award. I had a spare one in my pocket. Yeah. What about? No, they about don't. This, about this. No, they don't. Uh, do they? I don't think they have. We don't usually, do we? Yeah, you just asked me. No, we don't usually, do we? Councillor Carr, you, you... Yeah, I, I just want... It's a shame they've left, um, Chair, but I'd just like to point out something that... Uh, that how good this team are, that, uh, and it's a shame they've left, because a couple of weeks ago, I had a frantic phone call from a parent of Alderman White School, which is in my division, to say that not only had they not had their delivery of lateral flow tests um, but and uh, masks, uh, but also they'd run out. And I telephoned the emergency team, and I have to say that not only were they responsive there and then, but they had actually got a supply to the school within a matter of hours, and that's how good that team are. And it's a shame they're not here, uh, so that I can thank them for their hard work. They will be able to hear you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that, Councillor Carr. <clears throat> I'll move on. We have uh, obviously heard earlier, and we had the minute silence, but we received the sad news of the deaths of former County Councillor Jackie Jenkin Jones and County Councillor Maureen Dobson. Mrs Jenkin Jones represented Forrest and Mapley and then Sherwood from 1977 to 1993. She was Vice Chairman of the Environment Committee from 90, 1977 to 1981. 
Mrs Dobson has represented Collingham since 2013 as an independent member and has been a strong advocate for her local residents throughout that time. She has been a member of the Personnel Committee since 2014 and a member of the Community Safety Committee and then the Transport and Environment Committee. I'd like to invite members who wish to speak to say a few words about Councillor, ex-Councillor Jackie Jenkins-Jones and Councillor Maureen Dobson. Yeah. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's a privilege to be able to uh, pay tribute, particularly to Maureen. I didn't know Jackie Jenkins Jones, obviously did know Maureen, and I'm sure we'll all miss her uh, in this chamber. I'll start, start with Jackie. Um, as I said, I didn't have the privilege of knowing her. Um, goes back to the 1990s, her service. Others may be more able to speak about her, but I understand she gave a long and dedicated service to our community in Nottinghamshire and to the Conservative Party, where she met her husband, Peter. Um, she was presented with an OBE for her services to education in 1995, um, indicating the level of, of service and commitment she gave to our communities. Unfortunately, she became ill last year and passed away in mm. December. I'm sure all of our thoughts are with her children, Sarah and Tony, uh, if they're listening today. Uh, I did, of course, know Maureen. She was impossible to ignore, um, not least because she quite regularly stood uh, over there and, and demanded to be involved in more things and to have more engagement with the administration, quite rightly so, and often ticked me off. Uh, if I'd forgotten to consult with her about some decision on route to full council, uh, I was reminded of it uh, when we got here and when I, I stood up in this chamber. Uh, as I said, at policy committee, uh, rarely had a conversation where she didn't tell me off about something, uh, although often with a grin on her face uh, and often in uh, good humour. She was also willing to uh, accept and to give praise where that was due as well. And we all saw that uh, fairness uh, when she came to full council. Um, her being missing from the chamber today leaves a hole and, and we'll miss her quick wit. We will miss um, her often constructive uh, comments. She was often the voice uh, of reason. I will miss her savage put downs, uh, even though <laughs> occasionally directed uh, at me. Um, I, I found it hilarious uh, and uh, her presence and contribution to the chamber <clears throat> will be missed. It's testament to her in many ways and to her character that uh, the final uh, meeting I had with Maureen was via Zoom. Uh, and she sat in her house, uh, and although she would have known uh, about her illness at that time, uh, and she would have known um, perhaps that her time was uh, short, uh, she didn't mention that, she didn't raise it, she didn't use it. Uh, she asked me to continue to make sure that we looked after her communities, that we uh, invested in flood relief, that we sorted out the buses uh, in Collingham and the surrounding areas. Uh, so even in that very difficult time, she was focused on the people she represented. Uh, and she did a fantastic job. I know colleagues will want to speak uh, and reminisce around the chambers. She has many friends are on all sides of this chamber, um, particularly perhaps as a, a Conservative <laughs> councillor in a former life. Um, but I want to put on record my thanks for her service. Uh, I want to put on record the respect that I think we all share for her. As I said uh, previously, you know, regardless of party politics, uh, regardless of the history, I think we all valued her contribution to this place and we all recognise uh, the incredible work that she did over many years for her community. Um, so I want to place that on the record this morning, Chairman, uh, and offer my condolences to her family. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Neil Clark. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. And uh, actually, uh, I want to speak on... Uh, both uh, people that uh, we are paying tribute to today. Uh, as far as Jackie Jenkins Jones is concerned, uh, the leader has already mentioned some of her uh, past history, uh, and I'm aware that a lot of members here won't know her because she was a member on the County Council representing Sherwood in pre City Council unitary days. So, you know, we are talking. Uh, well, literally, in the last century. Uh, uh, but uh, she has always been a very uh, strong Conservative supporter. She was in the, the Young Conservatives. But she always had that very strong service to the community as well. Um, although she lived in uh, Mapley, um, she also had uh, good associations with other Conservative associations around the county, in including uh, Rushcliffe. So she did... Uh, give many years' service to the community. And uh, turning to uh, Maureen uh, Dobson, well, uh, again, the leader has mentioned her, and 
there's no doubt that we can uh, be assured that she was extremely robust and forthright uh, in all her dealings, but also incredibly conscientious representing her residents and, and her communities. Uh, she was a long-standing uh, Conservative supporter uh, way back, and, and indeed uh, as her husband uh, Vincent uh, was. Uh, and as uh, we've heard, uh, she uh, ended up as a, an independent councillor on this particular council. But she'd made a huge contribution to the community, and I've had dealings with her as uh, committee chairman on two committees uh, during the last term of office uh, as chairman of personnel committee. Uh, there she was, uh, and I think she spoke pretty much on every item uh, in the committee. So on the rare occasion that she uh, sent her apologies, uh, I venture to suggest that the meetings were uh, considerably shorter as the chairman. <laughs> uh, however, uh, she did always make very valid uh, contributions uh, and robust contributions. Uh, and her robustness continued on the Transport and Environment Committee. Uh, and she was always keen to make sure that she got her points across for her community and also as a member of the Highways Review Panel as well. And she made sure, similar to uh, the leaders just mentioned, that I was absolutely aware that she wanted to talk about drainage and make sure that we talk about it, Mr. Chairman, because I'm not going to let it go. I said, don't worry, Maureen, it, it's on the agenda, don't worry. So I think just as a testament, and uh, I think her daughter, who's uh, sitting in the public gallery, I think she can be extremely proud of uh, her mother's uh, achievements. Um, but just as a, a bit of an indication as to how Maureen thought about other people, uh, you may remember I had a hip operation only a, a couple of months ago and only two weeks before she died Maureen rang me to wish me well on my operation and I think that's just a testament as to how much she thought and cared uh, about other people and had empathy with other people. Thank you Chairman. Councillor Law. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I rise really to take this opportunity to uh, thank Maureen uh, for all uh, for her friendship, really, um, and uh, her advice, uh, her, her ability to be able uh, to um, manipulate me into doing what she wanted <laughs> was second to none. Um, but. Uh, um, I, I first met Maureen, actually. It was Patrick Mercer's campaign. And uh, uh, Maureen was the, was, the, was the campaign director. And I walked into the office and, and sat down. And there were all of us. I was sort of put in charge of, uh, of outdoor publicity. And Maureen started. And, and, and I, I thought, crikey me, where's this feisty woman come from? You know? And she ran that campaign. Uh, with a rod of iron. Uh, nobody stepped out of line. Everybody did what Maureen wanted. And as a result, it was extremely successful. And she did it times many um, uh, for successive uh, MPs in, in, in the Newark area. Her organisational capability was second, was, was, was second uh, to, to none. But where Maureen really scored was her her dedication to her residents. Uh, you know, that was something that I learnt uh, very early on. Uh, her residents came first every time. It didn't matter what Maureen was doing, her residents were the most important people, people to her. And I think we can all uh, learn that lesson uh, uh, from her. It was uh, truly, uh, t truly impressive. And not only did a residents come first, but she actually delivered for them. Uh, I, I used to be chairman of the Rights Away Committee, and every time there was a Rights Away issue, when Vinnie uh, w w was, was, was around, I, I was sort of like uh, catapulted into, into Collingham to sort out, um, to sort out um, uh, problems. And I remember going to Wigsley 
and there was a, a problem with the right of way. The right of way went right the way through the middle of the carp pond, and uh, and Maury was waxing lyrical. How can they? You know, we need to get this sorted out. If we don't get this sorted out, my residents are going to be uh, 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 going to have to walk on water. Get it sorted, Lord. No, no, mate. So off I off I went and and, and sorted it. But she always said thank you every time I did something for her. She was always pleased and and and, and showed gratitude gratitudes towards it so the, the people that are really going to lose out uh, through Maureen's passing are obviously her family and uh, and my commiserations go to them but also her electorate her electorate will miss her more than they will know because uh, because of her ability to be able to deliver on their behalf and I would say to Maureen Maureen you've got the best roads in Nottinghamshire you know you've got all your white lines are fresh, you know, you, you've got the best roads in the... Ah, oh, well, she, oh, well, I can deliver, she used to say, and she could deliver. And, and, and it, we, as I said before, we can all use, uh, learn, learn that lesson uh, as elected members. So a sad loss to us all, a sad loss to the chamber, a sad loss to the, her family, and a sad loss to the electorate, and a sad loss to Newark and Sherwood. District Council, which she was extremely dedicated towards, so I will miss her as well we, as we, we all will. Thank you. Councillor Fall. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> uh, first, to Jackie Jenkins Jones. I, d I didn't know her obviously because I know she served many years ago, but. I would like to pay tribute to Jackie on gaining, gaining an OB and her contribution to public life. And I know it's already been mentioned, but particularly her services to education, which were recognised in '95 when she was presented with an OBE. And so on behalf, on behalf of myself and the Labour, my heartfelt sympathy to, to Jackie's, Jackie's family. And now to Maureen. Hearing of Maureen's passing was one of the saddest days of my time as a councillor. It has been really hard for me to find the right words to describe her outstanding contribution to the work of this council. And her unparalleled commitment has already been referenced to her residence in her Collingham division. Just to try and find the right words, I had a look through some of the, the huge number of messages on social media and other places that people sent about her work as a member of this council <clears throat> in remembering her. Maureen was a thoroughly committed public servant. Maureen was a truly independent highly principled councillor. Maureen's dedication as a serving councillor was nothing less than extraordinary. And I think out of those, extraordinary is absolutely the best word to describe her. She was a real one-off. Not only did she serve her community so brilliantly, her contribution to debates in this chamber were hard-hitting, full of insight and wisdom, and delivered magnificently and often with humour. She was an amazing role model, wonderful orator. <clears throat> And she said real things when she spoke, real important things. She got to the nub of the argument every time. On a personal level, she was a good friend to me and many in our group. She'd often join some of us for lunch here on full council days when, you know, when we had the cafeteria. And she'd entertain us, brill entertain us brilliantly with stories and her deeply held views on life and politics. She was a really passionate woman, really passionate politician. Um, and... Uh, and that was that's just I think that's just a fantastic. And once we'd eaten, she'd insist on buying us all cake. And if that's not good friendship, I don't know what is. But seriously though, <coughs> Maureen was very special, and I'll very very I'll very much miss her kindness, her energy, amazing energy, dedication, and integrity. So my heartfelt condolences from the Labour Group to Rebecca, and all her family, who I know she loved very much. Councillor Zerosny. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I, I, I rise to add uh, my comments. For It's my 15th year here now, Mr Chairman, and I've obviously never served uh, at all without there being a Councillor Dobson here. First, Vincent, who he and I used to conspire very well together at the Fire Authority because he cared very passionately about uh, keeping Collingham Station open, which I think it was 2009 or so, where it was under threat, uh, and, and he fought tenaciously to keep that open. And then, of course, uh, Councillor Dobson. And as uh, Councillor Fole says, it's incredibly hard to find the words um, to accurately 
describe um, Maureen and her loss to this chamber and to, to the county be, in, in just a few minutes because it, it was immense uh, and she was a, a unique and strong character in this chamber um, and fiercely independent. She used to often uh, bring this chamber to a halt with trying to bring us together when we were busy fighting in political ways and, and she'd cut through that with no messing about often at Ben's expense, as we as remember, to try and to bring us together to remind us what we were uh, supposed to be here to do. Um, and I think she'll be enormously missed in the chamber and, of course, as residents say, in Collingham for that. Now, um, Maureen uh, actually nominated me three times to, for my national position in the LGA for the, for the Finance Resources Board. She nominated me every single time um, and at the last time I was successful enough in, in getting through. Uh, and she was quite really pleased for me, but I think she was more pleased because she had somebody to lobby then um, <laughs> at, at that national level. Um, and every time I had a meeting, she'd say, these are some things about finance I think you should know. I'd already been on the council six years before Maureen got on and immediately she... Um, uh, took me as somebody who needed educating and and um, and uh, quite rightly so and she had such an amazing uh, ability to to see through bluster and bluff and uh, and and help and support or, or shout you down where where it needed to be um, and I, I think uh, she's one of those public figures that are entirely unique she was a she was firm but she was still energetic. She was a mighty figure in this chamber and across, uh, across Nottinghamshire. Um, and her tenacity to get things done for the residents of Collingham is second to none. Uh, and she was an incredibly dedicated, uh, punctilious, in fact, um, about getting stuff done for all of those villagers. She spent time after time going to dozens of parish council meetings, listening to their views and getting things done. And, and I think... Um, there are very few councillors who put that amount of time in, uh, and she'll be sorely, sorely missed, uh, Mr Chairman. The last time she and I spent a long time talking was at the last county council camp. She sat with my mother for almost the entire night watching the count coming in and uh, waxing lyrical about the world. Um, and, and she changed as she was mellow. It was two o'clock in the morning and she was talking about how we put things right and get past party politics. Um, and uh, I'll remember those meetings here where we're not just the force of an incredible orator, but there are a couple of meetings where, where the emotion or the humour came out of some of her speeches that uh, I've, I've not seen other orators be able to deliver. Uh, I remember uh, bringing me to tears when she spoke about Vincent um, when he passed away in this chamber when she spoke. And I, and I remember some of the humour she had when she was so sharp at being able to, particularly Keith, <laughs> particularly Keith, he said something and she was so sharp, at, uh, a, a humorous line. It wasn't personal and I, and I think we'll miss that. Uh, Mr Chairman, I, I think... The one thing I, I do want to say, one of the projects that Maureen was most passionate about, and I guess members will know she spoke to us privately and, and uh, publicly a lot, was about the Trent Vale, um, the Trent, Va uh, Trent Vale Trail, which of course was linking Collingham, Bestorp, uh, North and South Clifton, Girton. And uh, she was incredibly passionate about getting that project done. And I'm aware it's not finished, Mr Chairman. There's the last leg of it to be done. And I hope after this, we can reflect on perhaps this county council finding a way to finish that project. And I hope in some way, with the family, we can find a way of, of dedicating that last stretch of that leg in Maureen's honour. I think it should be named after her in some way or dedicated in some way. And I think that would be the smallest of fitting tributes to remember a fantastic woman that I think we, I and this chamber will miss very, very much. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Councillor Gurley. That was good timing, having been, having been uh, mentioned by Jason. I think um, I'm not going to go, really go on about um, uh, everything that Maureen's achieved and that, because that's, that's, that's a given. I'm going to talk more about uh, uh, my relationship with Maureen, really, which, um, to be a bit fair to say, was quite up and down at times. And uh, I think she told me off that many times I thought we were married. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> she did use my name quite a lot in this chamber, and also um, 
on the, on the District Council because she was in the Economic Development Committee there as well, telling me what I should be doing. But she always did it with love. And I'm not saying that lightly. There was never, ever, or I never felt there was any malice in what she said. She said it because she believed it. She said it because she wanted it to happen. And she said it in a way that she only knew how. And I really respected that. And I respected uh, and actually loved Maureen, uh, even though our relationship was, was, was quite uh, feisty at times. And, and when I first met Maureen, I was absolutely brand spanking new to politics. I'd come out, I'd come out serving in the Grandier Guards. I'd got it, uh, started a business. I joined a business club and I was chairman of a business club. And before I knew it, I was asked if I wanted to go to a charity meeting, which I said, yeah. And it turned out to be a conservative charity meeting, and before I knew it, I was a conservative. So up until that point, I'd never even voted. Uh, and then, it's, it's true, as, as mem many members of the forces vote, because we all think you're all peeing the same bucket. So, so you know, it was just... <laughs> but it was just, it was just, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't into politics at all. And, and then I, I sort of rose through the association ranks quite quickly. And then the first time I remember meeting Maureen, well... It must have been the first time, because you wouldn't, you wouldn't remember meeting her, wouldn't you? It was in an association uh, meeting. She was a very prominent member of the New York Conservative Association. She was a staunch conservative, and she pushed the conservative uh, way in the New York Association, making sure that, we, uh, that everybody in there were conservatives and were doing the conservative thing. And, and I remember that I um, was in a, um, an executive meeting, and I said something, and it must have been, something silly because she was busy straight on me telling me off. Now, I'm known for my feistiness as well. And, and the room went completely quiet, expecting me to go back at Maureen and, and, and tell her where to stick her opinion, basically. And I just said, oh, thank you very much, Maureen. That's really helpful information. And uh, we moved on. And you could see this relief in this room uh, just sink down because they thought it was all uh, going, uh, going to kick off, really. Um, and, and so that's, to me, I, I'll miss, you know, um, the learning, really, that, I, that I've received from Maureen. Um, you know, I got on better with her, actually, when she became an independent councillor. Um, because, you know, it, she was too, too dominating for me in the, in the Conservative Party. But when she became a, an independent, we actually then had discussions, more discussions than we ever had, about, about things that we wanted to achieve together. Uh, and, um, and and it was good. And, and you know, it's sort of towards the end, I was, I, I was sort of trying to contact her and talk to her and see how she was. But she never told you she was ill. And I was getting all these messages that she's not very well. Uh, um, but she, she, she wouldn't admit it. She just wanted to, uh, she wanted to go in her way. She wanted to finish her life how she lived her life. And, and absolutely total respect and love to Maureen for that. And, and my, my heart goes out to her family as well and the feelings that they're obviously going through now in terms of the, the loss that they've got uh, with Maureen not being there. So that, that, that's really all I want to say. It's, it's not, not about what she's achieved. We all know that's amazing. It's about the influence she's had on me personally in terms of how I live my life. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Councillor Lee. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, everybody used to um, see me and Maureen. We used to argue a lot. Um, she was my county councillor and I was the district councillor. Um, we did argue a lot. Um, I massively respected her and I was lucky enough to be able to tell her that a few months before she sadly passed. Um, a story that I've never really shared was in 2008 when I was sadly injured. Um, I got a knock on my door when I moved to Coddington. Maureen Dobson was my county councillor. And her and Patrick Mercer were there. I didn't have any clue who either of them were. And they both came to check on me to make sure I'm, I was all right. And that was Maureen. She was stern and she was vicious. When, and, and she'd tell you so, but she was caring. And she cared for her residents. And before I became a Conservative, I used to vote for Maureen. She was my county councillor. And I used to respect her so much because she was, all she, I think it's been mentioned very um, lots of times here, but she used to fight for her residents. And there's a story um, that um, you can Google it. Um, when I first applied for a blue badge at this authority, I didn't get the blue badge. And that's the main reason why I got in, involved in politics. But it was Maureen who got me my blue badge. And 
I was telling a resident this story a few weeks ago and he stopped me and says, Maureen did the exact same for me. And it was a week before she sadly passed. She was still fighting for her residence. And if, any, if, if, if the one thing I will always remember about Maureen is, until the end, she fought for her residence. Thank you very much, Joanne. Councillor Roger Jackson. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's very obvious from the comments that have been made this morning already that the respect that Maureen had in this chamber and respect that she had in a local community and surrounding places. I first got to know Maureen 20 odd years ago when I was a young councillor, wet behind the ears and had my first meetings at um, Kellam Hall. And uh, Maureen did actually take me under her wing a little bit. And she taught me how to be a councillor. Uh, and, and the things to uh, know about the officers, how it ran and everything else. And I always remember that and appreciate that. But the one thing she did teach me, which has been said to her many times, is you must always look after your constituents and residents. They are the main people. They're the people who let you there. They're the people you need to be representing and looking after. And she didn't let politics get in the way of that either. And she also said, taught me, say it how you saw it. Don't hide behind things. Just say what you think and say how you saw it. Not everybody's going to agree with you, but you still stick up for your, what you think. The only times um, she did criticise me was when I was wearing one of my other hats as the chairman of the Nottinghamshire County Show, because the Newark Showground was in her patch. And, um, you know, sometimes we had rock concerts or this, that and the other, or some noise affected some of her residents. Or we had traffic congestion on a few times when we had large events. Um, morning, we were always on the phone to me. He said, Roger, what are we going to do about this, et cetera, et cetera. But having said that, she always supported the county show and was a great supporter of us there. And in fact, she always helped me, and what well, I'm still doing, to lobby to get a third entrance into the showground to try and reduce the traffic congestion around it. Because, you know, it, it is a very successful site. We, do, we will miss Maureen in this chamber and her contributions to it. My condolences to her family, and Maureen, we will miss you. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chairman. As a relatively, still a relatively new councillor, my contact with Councillor Dobson was only quite recent, and it came from very particular circumstances around a school in the Collingham Division. I think Councillor Smith will actually reference this in more detail if, if and when he speaks. Maureen contacted me to discuss the situation and the processes around it and to ask for an opportunity to speak for her community at a committee of which she was not a member, so didn't have that right. She was totally invested but mindful of the protocols. She was a community champion who made sure to give clear voice to her residents' needs and difficulties strong-minded and straight talking. Her community and residents should be proud of her service as she was of and for them. And I'm only sorry, having begun to know Maureen, that our time working together was so short. To her family, I would offer my condolences. I'd also offer my thanks. Councillor Sam Smith. Thank you, Chairman. I was only elected onto this council in May last year, so sadly I didn't have the pleasure of working with Councillor Dobson for as long as I would have liked. But we were fellow Newark councillors, and in that short time we did work closely on two projects that I'll reference. The first was the Highway Review Panel, which involved, as you can imagine, a lot of technical and detailed presentations. But Councillor Dobson turned up every time and kept us energised at each of those meetings by passing round her famous ginger biscuits. In her usual frank manner, Councillor Dobson would always cut through the jargon and focus the conversation in questioning around the end goal of improving our road and drain maintenance programme. And she would always, always stand up for Collingham by saying to the chairman, and don't forget about the rural areas of my villages, 
Council adopts its contribution to this review based on years of experience and her real world perspective brought to it will continue to benefit the residents of Nottinghamshire for many years to come as the outcomes continue to be implemented. Now, it was a real pleasure of mine to sit next to Maureen at most of those meetings, as I admired her contribution, but she also often made me laugh with her quick wit and directness. The second project came within my school's portfolio role in June, when a consultation period on the future of North Clifton School began. And as we all know, Councillor Dobson isn't one for sitting round and seeing what happens. She totally understood the reasons behind this and immediately sprung into action to support the school in her patch remaining open. During, during a parents' consultation meeting, Councillor Dobson, as we all know she would, stood in front of those keen to help the school and in her usual action speak louder than words manner, she told them exactly how they could help. She signed up two new governors to the school, launched an after-school club and helped to organise volunteers to improve the school garden area and den with homemade play equipment. Last year, I was due to visit that school with Councillor Dobson and sadly, due to her own health, she was unable to join me. And it was a real honour of mine to officially open that garden area in Maureen's absence. All the parents, all the carers, and every single person at that event came to tell me how extremely grateful they were for her help in making that happen. I'm extremely grateful to her personally for supporting me with this matter and to her efforts during that consultation period. She turned up, as the chairman of the committee just mentioned, to speak as a non-voting member on that committee and spoke in her usual factual self, which added to our discussion. This councillor will be forever in debt to her for the way in which she ensured the community were informed and engaged on improving the situation at North Clifton. And the North Clifton community will continue to benefit from a new community space while school children have a much improved area to play in. I will always remember Councillor Dobson for her straight talking and common sense approach. But what shone through most of all for me was, as everyone else has said, was Councillor Dobson's commitment to improving the lives of her residents that she was so proud to represent in such a forthright manner. That, Mr Chairman, is something we should all embrace. I send my heartfelt condolences to all her friends and family. Councillor Carr. Thank you, Chairman. Um, very, very sad when I heard about uh, Maureen. Um, in 2017, I happened to be the only Liberal Democrat to be elected to this authority. And you can imagine, I greeted that prospect with trepidation. And quite frankly, Maureen took me under her wing. We sat at the back over there, the, the, the terrible twosome. Um, could see everything that was going off, could hear everything that was going off. And I have to say, what could have been a terrible four years was probably the best four years I've spent in this chamber. She was an absolute dream to be next to. Uh, as Councillor Smith said, I, I had to actually pinch myself many times to stop laughing out loud uh, at some of the, the quips and the humour that, that came from Maureen. And we were a bit like, you remember the Muppet show, the, the, the two old men? We, we were a bit like that. We were sat there and we were saying, well, what a silly thing to say, and, you know, things like that. But I, I have to say, as I've said, um, it was a fantastic time. And the one thing that I'll always remember, and it happened every meeting, because you can see who's sat up there from over there. And Maureen used to say to me, was that sat up there? And I said, look, Maureen, if you don't know, how on earth do you expect <laughs> me to know? Because she knew everyone, she engaged with everybody, particularly officers, and that was why she was so successful, because of the relationships that she had with people. And as I say, the, 
last four years when I sat next to, to Maureen uh, with her sweets and it well, didn't help having Yvonne in front of me either or also bought sweets and Nikki and that's probably why I'm the shape that I am and uh, that will I shall always remember it because it was such a joyous thing to have to happen to me so whoever put me and Maureen together for that four years I do thank them because I, as I say it turned what could have been awful for me into something that was completely the opposite thank you Council, Councillor Saddington. Thank you, Chairman. Well, listening to everybody, you're talking about recent past. I can tell you that I first met Maureen, and without you calculating, I'll say it was a long time ago, I was 20. Long time. Long time. So I have known Maureen for many, many years. We were, I remember Vincent when he was on the district council and I was friendly with Vincent. And Maureen and I have known each other so long that we were friends. We were on the planning committee together for 20 years before COVID uh, came along. And at New York and Sherwood District Council, you used to go on a bus to see the sites in the morning before you sat at night and discussed the applications. She sat in the front, I sat behind. For two and a half, three hours, we reminisced on the past. And believe me, I know many people in New York. She knew many people in New York. And we were talking about people that we'd forgotten about, in actual fact. It was a wonderful occasion every month to go out and discuss the past. Now, many of you may not know, um, Maureen was not only a very well-respected politician, she was actually a hairdresser. And if you wanted a good cut, you went to Maureen's uh, salon in Newark. And that's when I first met her. She then mixed with our family, and not my wider family, I might say, and um, even today, the person who does my hair was trained to cut by Maureen. And often we talk about it uh, because she worked with Maureen and she's now set up a salon in the village where I live of North Muscombe. So to me, Maureen carries on because this lady cuts in the same way as Maureen. So it's a great memory for me. Um, it hasn't been mentioned, actually, that Maureen was mayor of New York. She was mayor of New York at one time. Um, she was extremely well respected in New York, long before politics came around. And she used to talk to me on the bus about her daughter, Rebecca, grandchildren, and her son, Charles, who lives in Canada. So... We, I have wonderful memories. We sat there, we discussed, things came up that really nobody ever knows about. And we sat and we laughed and we talked about old times. It was great. And I will miss Maureen. And the last time I was in this chamber, she sat across there. And something came up about health scrutiny. She looked across the chamber, shouted to me and said, Sue, you need to come to Collingham. It's all in a mess out there. Come and have a look. And in Maureen's memory, I will go to Collingham. I will make an appointment. I will go and look what's happening out there, see if they have some problems that somebody can address. And I will do that just for Maureen, whereas I wouldn't go around every health centre, so before you start asking me. <laughs> <laughs> so I will miss Maureen. Um, she was a good friend. She was a, reli a reliable friend. And she was a very true friend. And uh, I think the only time I got told off by her was when we were at Newark and Sherwood and we were in Kellam Hall. Of course, it was the old building. And I arrived late for a meeting and the door went out of my hand. And I lost the door and so it threw backwards. And she said, if you're going to come in late, come in quietly. <laughs> and I think that was... Yeah, I think that was the only time I was told off by her. But I will miss her and I do offer my condolences to her family. Thank you. Councillor Barnfather. Yes, uh, th thank you. 
uh, Chairman. We've we've heard the word feisty used, I think, by um, a few speakers this morning in relation to Maureen. I think feisty is probably a family trait rather than it being just uh, restricted to Maureen. When I arrived here in 2009 with, and was appointed as the deputy whip at that time, uh, Kay sat me next to Vincent. Uh, and part of my job was to control Vincent within the chamber here, especially when I wanted to shout across at the Labour benches, particularly when Stella was speaking. Uh, and Vincent and I had a few words during that four-year term of 9 to 13, uh, also when I was the chair of the planning authority, and there were issues which um, applied to his division, and likewise on the fire authority over uh, the Collingham retained station uh, that's already been alluded to by Jason. So Vincent left this chamber in 2013 and Maureen arrived and it was frying pan into the fire uh, as far as feistiness was concerned because obviously Maureen continued it very much in the in the Dobson trait uh, in terms of having an opinion and not being frightened to express that opinion. But Maureen was eloquent she was combative, but she was fair. And her and I sat together on the uh, then Culture Committee, uh, and along with John Cotty. And occasionally, Maureen would allow one of us to speak, um, other than her, um, and, and to actually uh, voice an opinion. Uh, but Maureen and I got on extremely well. And in 2021, uh, when we arrived uh, back in this council after the elections in 2021 and I was fortunate enough to be appointed as the administration business manager, Maureen uh, uh, came to see me uh, and she informed me in May of last year that she had a terminal illness and she swore me to secrecy. I was to tell no one about it and I told no one about it and that was quite difficult. Maureen wanted no concessions, she wanted no special treatment, but she felt that as the business manager, I should actually know of her illness. And the only concession that, that she actually ever accepted was that I was able to facilitate her sitting on the two committees of her choice during the last time that she was with us. Uh, and Maureen would regularly pop in to see me and update me on her condition which obviously progressively got worse. And it was quite difficult because other members in this chamber would say, do you think Maureen's all right? She's not looking too well, or Maureen's lost weight. But Maureen had sworn me to secrecy, and I respected that and did not share until Maureen herself chose to share with other members about her condition. Because she did not want any special treatment. She did not want any pity. Maureen was resolute, resilient, and effectively resigned to her condition right until the end. She never stopped working for her residents, she never stopped working for her division, and she never stopped representing what is best about this authority and this chamber. Maureen, we will miss you. Condolences to the family. Councillor Payne. Thank you, Mr Chairman. When we arrived today to the uh, chamber, there was something significant missing in the room. Uh, that beautiful smile, that impeccably dressed woman that welcomed everybody to this chamber without fear or favour and always took the kind-hearted moment to say, how are you doing? How's everything going? And to ask about you and your family. I, I didn't think this moment would ever come where we had to have a conversation about Maureen without her here in this chamber speaking with her usual energy and ebullience from the bench just behind me. But I want to just say a few words about how much I admired her, not just as a political colleague, but as a friend. And when I found out that she'd passed away, not knowing, as Councillor Barnfather said, that she was deeply ill, I was absolutely and remain heartbroken about it. She was one of my best friends here in the chamber. I did get to know her very briefly in 2013 when I was first elected, but had the pleasure to get to know her much better in 2014 when I was an incredibly naive 
candidate in the parliamentary by-election in Newark trying to find my way through what was clearly going to be a tough campaign. And she invited me to her house as then somebody who had deeply opposing views to me. And she put her arm around me and she gave me advice. And she was kind to me from that moment right till the end when she passed away. And that was the measure of Maureen. The tough exterior, but below it, deeply compassionate, full of love, and somebody, yes, who would always call you out if you were falling short, but always saw the positive in everybody and always looked for the very best, as Councillor Gurling said, in everybody. If she was giving you a ticking off, it was because she cared about you and because she wanted people to do better for their community. I really, really, really miss her. And the one thing that strikes me about the last time I saw uh, Maureen was she repeated a phrase that she said to me the first time I met her in the by-election. She said, the only advice I can give you, Michael, is to be yourself and keep going. And the last time I saw her physically, she gave me a huge hug and she said, be yourself and keep going. And of course, I didn't know the significance of what she was saying at the time. And like Councillor Barnfather, I thought over recent months she'd not looked very well, but never thought to ask the question, never thought to uh, pry. And I reflect now on the significance of that. And that was the measure of her. She cared about every single person in this chamber. She cared about everybody who worked for this authority. In June 2019, eight-year-old Isabella and five-year-old Harvey and their mother Justine Colliston died in a fire that ravaged a house in 22 minutes and almost lost their uh, father as well. He was severely injured. And she was heartbroken, Maureen, because it rocked her local community. And the first thing she did was to offer her condolences to the family, to work in the community to make sure that there was more awareness about smoke alarms, but also to throw her arms around the staff who had had to respond and carry out the bodies of those young children in that fire at Collingham Fire Station, she was deeply, deeply concerned about the staff who had responded. And that was the measure of Maureen as uh, a person. I just finished by saying this, Mr Chairman. She was a blessing to her family. She was a blessing to her community. And we were incredibly blessed in this chamber to share in her company. I will miss you so much, Maureen. Thank you very much for being an outstanding friend. <laughs>
huge character in this chamber. But we know that. We know that. And she might not be sat in this chamber, but I think it was Jason. She will live on in this chamber. In our memories, she will live with us because of how she was. Um, now, as I say, it was probably 45 minutes, 50 minutes by the time we got to Collingham. Um, and and I, I, I do, I am, I'm a big lad, but I do have to report to my missus regularly so she knows exactly where I am. So, after about half past nine, my phone rings. Where are you? I said, I'm sat with Maureen Dobson and I don't know when I'm going to be back. <laughs> <laughs> we were sat talking. She sat me outside in her house talking about you guys and what you've done, what holidays you've had. Um, and it was brilliant. It was, no, honestly, uh, Keith, I, I can honestly never remember speaking so little and learning so much from this. Look, she, she was brilliant. Uh, Rebecca, it's obvious we all have fond, fond memories uh, uh, and lots of love for her. Um, and we can't imagine what you're going through. But... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those uh, those words. And I'd just like from the chair to offer my condolences to the families of both uh, uh, Jackie Jenkins Jones and uh, Maureen Dobson in their sad loss. My next item is to update you on uh, business undertaken since the, the last meeting. And uh, I've attended uh, some eight uh, events since uh, we last met at the council in, and I was very privileged and proud to represent the council at the tree lighting ceremony at County Hall and welcome several uh, schools and children including some uh, children from special schools with, with severe disabilities who, uh, who thoroughly enjoyed themselves and uh, were welcomed into the, uh, the, the uh, civic suite for the first time for a couple of years due to COVID. So that was, a, that was a, an extremely enjoyable uh, event and I know uh, Wendy uh, would join me in saying how well behaved they were and what a credit they were to the schools that they were representing. Uh, on the 4th of December I attended a, a Muslim uh, gathering at the Rosecliffe Spencer uh, Academy in Rushcliffe and we were there as special guests and were royally entertained and looked after and it was a, a, a showcase of young, again young people's talents and dancing and singing. It was a thoroughly enjoyable day. On the 5th of December, I attended St. Wilfred's Church in Kirkby, uh, the Order of St. Lazarus, and uh, they had a carol service and an, an event, and we joined them for a meal afterwards. Uh, on the 6th of December, the Inspire concert was held at the Albert Hall, but uh, due to uh, the fact that I was uh, uh, still recovering from my operation, I decided that it was probably a bit risky, so we attended the... Uh, concert via a Teams link, but it was a thoroughly enjoyable uh, evening. On the 10th of December, I attended a tree planting ceremony in uh, Retford for the Royal British Legion. On the 15th, we did the uh, prize draw for our Christmas raffle. And uh, I won't uh, embarrass uh, a certain lady in the chamber by saying who won the star prize. Um, <laughs> it's one of your neighbours. No, 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 it was a member, but I'm not going to embarrass her. I'm not going to embarrass her. <laughs> it might have been, yeah. <laughs> uh, on, on the 18th of uh, December, I attended a fundraising event uh, organised by the High Sheriff of Nottinghamshire to support his charities, and I, th I believe on the day he raised over £2,000, so it was a an extremely enjoyable day but then when you've got a captive audience of consultants and doctors I think uh, it, uh, it, it does help. Um, I've also had obviously the weekly civic catch-ups and I recorded my Christmas and New Year message and also the recycling pledge for Veolia so hopefully all the members in this chamber are making a recycling pledge because Veolia are going to give some money to my charity for every pledge that people make so uh, get on the, on the website and make a pledge ab about recycling. And, and uh, I hope, if you do, that you actually keep it up as well. So uh, that, uh, that, that concludes my uh, update from since, since the last meeting. Uh, lunch 
as we're almost at 12 o'clock, we will have an hour's lunch break at approximately one o'clock today. Item five is constituency issues, and it gives members who have pre previously given notice by the deadline the opportunity to speak for up to three minutes on any particular matter relevant to their constituencies or any particular issue arising in their electoral division which is relevant to the services provided by the County Council. This is an opportunity simply to air these issues in Council. This is not, uh, it will not give rise to a debate on the issues or a question and answer session. Members are reminded the maximum time limit of 15 minutes for this item and uh, you may only speak for three minutes. I have notification of two speeches and I call on Council Elizabeth Williamson who has a issue about HGVs in Brinsley. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I rise today to talk about the danger to public safety caused by heavy goods vehicles in parts of my division. I've been contacted by numerous residents who live on Cordy Lane, Mansfield Road and Nether Green. They have to live with the daily issues caused by heavy goods vehicles and other huge vehicles thundering down their roads at all hours of the day and night. Residents can tell when there's been a particular busy time as they cause major disruption to their sleep. When the road was built, it was not built for this sort of heavy usage. And let's face it, the majority of the lorries are only shaving about two minutes off their journey time. They can easily get to their destinations by the A610. When residents walk from Brinsley to Eastwood or Brinsley to Underwood and back again, they are literally taking their life in their own hands. If we don't deal urgently with this issue, then I and residents believe it's an accident waiting to happen. So what's the solution, Mr Chairman? Well, a cut-off road from the top end of Underwood onto the A610 would be a huge help. It would help stop these huge lorries going through Underwood, Brinsley and Eastwood too. It would also be safer for the children at Hall Park School whose safety is in jeopardy. I'm not blaming the HGV drivers, Mr Chairman. They're told to get from A to B in the shortest time possible. Indeed, it's a testament to their skills that we don't have more accidents as they negotiate these tight bends and corners. After today's meeting, I'll be emailing via East Midlands asking for a speed survey and also be asking for a comprehensive risk assessment of the road. I'll also be asking for an officer to meet residents and me in Brinsley so we can work together to find solutions to the problems of HGVs on Nottingham's most dangerous roads. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. I call upon Councillor Jason Zdrosny to talk about COVID cases in Ashfield. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Chairman. I want to speak about uh, COVID cases in my division of Ashfield and across the Ashfield district as a whole. <clears throat> While it's welcome that COVID cases are going down, Mr Chairman, as Omicron seems to have reached its peak, Kingsmill Hospital in Councillor Smith's uh, division is still overwhelmed by cases as our NHS seems to struggle to cope. Our doctors are struggling and residents continue to be unable to get face-to-face -face GP appointment. Kingsmill Hospital and Newark Hospital have had to delay over 35,000 non-urgent operations. Last week, Mr Chairman, the 30,000th resident in Ashfield received a positive COVID test. Everyone now knows someone who has been impacted by COVID. Ashfield has a particular problem with vaccinations and as a district council, Ashfield's done everything possible to ensure our population is vaccinated. This includes working with the CCG to ensure regular visits from the vaccination bus and educating residents in the importance of getting a vaccination. We still have issues, however, as many residents simply do not want to engage in the vaccination process. According to latest government figures, 14% of people aged 12 or over haven't received their first vaccination, 19% haven't had their second dose and 38% haven't had booster jabs. And let me put that into figures. That's close to 17,000 residents of Ashfield who haven't engaged in the vaccination process. The question needs to be asked why. We've tracked and the figures and the percentage of residents not receiving one jab has only moved up 2% in the last three months. 
The question, Mr Chairman, is what's stopping them? Is it conspiracy theories? <laughs> Somebody from Kirkby, uh, Kirkby rang me before Christmas uh, to tell me they wouldn't be getting the jab as they believed the government were injecting liquid SIM cards to track them. They'd seen it on Facebook and YouTube and somebody had mentioned it in the pub and I asked him how I could call him again to answer his concerns and he gave me his mobile number and said he'd be available anytime. Um, is it the fear of becoming ill, Mr Chairman? I've had a resident who didn't have the jab, who's now uh, in Sutton, who, who's in his 12th week of being severely poorly with long COVID uh, and hasn't had the vaccine. And is it social mobility, exacerbated certainly in many parts of Ashfield District by low car ownership? Uh, places like Carsick, Selston and Stanton Hill have the worst bus services in the whole of the county. Is it that people simply can't get to vaccination centres, Mr Chairman? Mr Chairman, the problem simply is the biggest thing facing residents is now not trusting the government. Uh, when we should be talking about importance of getting jabbed, all we're talking about is parties at Downing Street. The public in places like Ashfield have lost confidence in the government and the Prime Minister has lost moral authority. Many people aren't social distancing, many people aren't wearing masks and now we're talking about introducing charges for lateral flow. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Mr Chairman, I'm presenting a petition today calling for the reduction of the speed limit to 30 mile an hour outside Barnby Crossing Cottages on Barnby Road. This petition has been signed by 227 Newark residents and has a total of 504 signatories, including from as far as New York, Brazil and Nigeria. So I hope they're watching today. I'm pleased to report that since my work with Highways colleagues on this and this petition being launched, a consultation into reducing the speed limit has already begun. 30 mile an hour outside Barnby Crossing Cottages would increase the safety for my residents who walk along this stretch of residential road, particularly for those who walk to Barnby School, and I hope to see it implemented. Call upon Councillor Richard Butler, who has a request for review and reduction of speed limit in Tolleton Village. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yes, this petition has been organised by Tolleton Parish Council and uh, signed by 83 residents. They are very worried about speeding traffic, uh, in particular along Tolleton Lane and uh, Cockgrave Lane. Uh, Tolleton Lane has mixed uh, speeds through the village of 30, then 40, then 30, and it all gets very confusing. Residents are worried about the confusion to, to uh, drivers and also danger to pedestrians. And on uh, Cockgrave Lane, there is an unlit section which is uh, unrestricted, so a 60 mile limit. And uh, they're naturally very worried about that because it is seeing more and more traffic. So uh, as a result, it may only be 83 uh, signatures, but in terms of percentages of the village, it is really quite high. And uh, indeed, if I lived in Tolleton, I would be signing it as well because I uh, do share their concerns. So their formal request is to reduce the speed limit from 40 to 30 on Tolleton Lane between Medina Drive and the S Bend and to reduce a section of the speed Thank you very much. Well, we'll just get on with it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Councillor Boyd Elliott to present uh, a request to address traffic issues on Lingwood Lane in Woodborough. <laughs> this one's for you, Neil. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, my petition signed by. Just, just Woodborough residents. <laughs> uh, small village, uh, local school Woodborough Wood, situated on Lingwood Lane. Um, so in collaboration, we love collaborators, in collaboration with the parish council, um, we've identified two sites uh, nearby the school, which is uh, perfect for parking. Uh, we just want that, the county to come out and assess the situation, get those kids to travel from those sites to the school safely and stop parking on Lingwood Lane and causing problems really. Okay, thank you.
I call uh, Councillor Penny Gowland regarding the gates to the highway at Nottingham Forest City Ground Stadium. Thank you. I'm here to present a petition on behalf of the residents living in the homes neighbouring Nottingham Forest Football Ground who are frustrated, to say the least, by the situation regarding the new gates that, have been barric that barricade them into their homes during match days. I've heard of residents unable to get home from work, children missing sporting activities and carers who cannot get out from behind the gates to get to the next uh, person they're looking after. The Labour Group are proposing that Council, along with Nottingham Forest Fo uh, Football Ground and the police, come together with the residents to find a solution which keeps the fans safe and makes these roads accessible to residents, as we see in other parts of the country with similar football grounds. We understand the safety measures are needed on match days and they're going to be important in the long term, but we need better long term solutions for the benefits of residents and fans. I understand that uh, Councillor Clark is looking into this. I call Councillor Jim Creamer, request for a pedestrian crossing at Westdale Lane. Thank you, Chairman. This is 599 signatures from the residents of Westdale Lane and the users of, Stan uh, of the local school. The, uh, the area itself is a very, very busy road, Westdale Lane. It's got traffic lights a few hundred yards one side and just up a hill and around the corner, traffic lights the other. So it's actually a little sweet spot for speeders. So it is actually extremely dangerous on that um, on that stretch of road and we're asking for a permanent crossing on that road which is local councils we actually support as well it's an, it is a matter of safety it is an issue it's an extremely busy road and as we know where schools are involved it gets busy at least twice a day extremely so so yes we're asking for a, a permanent crossing both from the residents and the units of the local school thank you mr chairman I call Councillor John Cotty to request for a crossing improvements on Nottingham Road outside Keyworth Primary and Nursery School in Kegworth. Uh, Keyworth, uh, Chairman. So I do, uh, I, I do like Kegworth, but I'm, I'm not there, Councillor, and it's in a different county. Um, yes, at Nottingham Road Primary School, um, the residents in that area put together a petition to ask the County Council to look at the possibility of putting in a crossing and um, I'd like to present 524 signatures on the petition and I would also like to thank the Jamaica, Portugal, France, Australia, Switzerland, Greece, Netherlands, Hong Kong, Canada and the USA for putting in their uh, comments in it and I have to say that the uh, petition was run online and I'm afraid me and technology don't really take it to um, Germans but I've managed to get the petition together for them. Go show some people who sign anything. The petitions be referred to the appropriate committee for consideration and a report brought back to council in due course in accordance with standing orders. All in favour? And we move on then to 6B, which is responses to the petitions presented to the, the Chairman of the County Council last time. And I move that the contents of the report and the actions approved be noted. Is that agreed? All in favour? Clearly carried. Thank you. We move on then to agenda item 7. And I call upon Councillor Chris Barnfather to, make, to move the recommendations in the report. Thank you, uh, uh, Chairman. Uh, we have a report before us, which effectively is a bit of uh, housekeeping. Uh, obviously, any movement of members from one committee to another is a matter for political groups. But where that uh, movement involves people in the position of either chair or vice chair of a committee, 
um, it's courtesy to bring it before full council, who, of course, at the annual council in May, endorse those appointments. So I move the motion that's before you to approve the changes in the papers um, as uh, uh, outlines. Thank you. And I call upon Councillor Bruce Lawton to second the motion. Who <laughs> Can I second that motion in uh, Councillor Lawson's absence, Chair, and I'll reserve my right to speak. Anyone uh, wish to speak? Councillor Welsh. Um, yeah, really, really quickly, I'd just like to place on record my thanks for the work that Councillor Barney has done on Health Scrutiny Committee in particular, um, the work that he's done with regards to helping improve maternity services and how personally supportive he was when I shared my own experiences. I think he's been an absolute asset to our Health Scrutiny Committee and I hope he'll take that work to adult social care. So I did want to put on record my absolute personal thanks. He's been absolutely fantastic. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bradley, do you want to exercise your right to speak? No? <coughs> do you, did you indicate to speak, Councillor Barnfather? No? No? No, sorry. Some confusion. Never mind. <laughs> Right. Uh, in that case, can we uh, put the motion to the vote? All those in favour? That's clearly carried. Agenda item 8A is questions to Nottinghamshire and City of Nottingham Fire Authority, and I have received none. So we move on then to uh, agenda item 9B, which is questions to committee chairman. And as set out in the Constitution, a maximum of 60 minutes is allowed for the questions to committee chairman, after which any remaining questions will receive a written response. I would like to remind members that following a change in the Constitution, there will only be one supplementary question, which must be from the member who asked the original question. The supplementary question should be on the same matter and should be in the form of a question, not a statement, and there will be no adjournment dis debates. There are 13 questions as follows. And I call upon Councillor Jim Creamer to ask his question about actions to mitigate the anticipated cost of living crisis. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Question to the Leader of the Council. Can the Leader de detail what actions will be undertaken by this Council in the upcoming budget? to mitigate the impact of the anticipated cost of living crisis facing the people of Nottinghamshire. Thank you. Can I call upon the Leader to respond? Thank you, Chair, um, and thank you, Councillor Creamer. Uh, later today, there's a motion from Councillor Zadrozny regarding the rising cost of living, so without um, wishing to preempt that motion, I'm happy to extract the three key points from it. Point one, obviously, this Council does note and recognise the uh, considerable cost of living uh, increase that will affect our residents. Uh, number two, that the council believes we should do everything in our power to support those residents. And indeed, there are a significant number of programmes. Uh, I think uh, officers informed me yesterday that our COVID-related support over the last couple of years amounts to some £12 million odd pounds directly to uh, the most vulnerable residents. Uh, and number three is that this council will obviously uh, consider the impact of that cost of living crisis through our budget setting process, as we uh, always do. Uh, the question and the motion later are a little premature because uh, obviously our council tax plans, medium term financial strategy will come forward in the coming weeks through first finance committee and then obviously our full council uh, budget meeting in February. So uh, I'm sure uh, Jim will understand I can't go into the full details of that quite yet, but colleagues will have the opportunity to properly study and to uh, either support or amend those proposals in the coming weeks. I look forward to that constructive conversation and to the uh, no doubt full and comprehensive alternative budgets that will be coming uh, for our consideration to that meeting as well. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Councillor Bradley. Uh, Councillor Creamer, do you have a supplementary? Yes, thank you, Chair, and thank, thank you, Leader, for the, uh, for the answer of, the, of recognise and consider the impact. Uh, the supplementary question is, with national forecasts indicating a wave of significant price rises, such as an average national insurance rise of £250, Income tax threshold changes reported to cost £150. 
Food bills and other housing costs both rise on average by £169 respectively. Energy bills expected to rise by £600. Average council tax rate expected by £67. Uh, these are the costs will be devastating to many residents and families in Nottinghamshire. I'm sure the leader would agree that the county council shouldn't be making life harder for people by making unnecessary cuts or doing little to help underpaid key frontline workers who are often already struggling to make ends meet. Therefore, my question to the leader of the council is: one, write to the prime—will will he, sorry, write to the prime minister to outline what Nottinghamshire residents can expect the government to do on the cost of living crisis, addressing each of these price rises specifically. So that's something for the whole council, not directly to the finance. And two, will the leader himself commit not to cutting the concessionary issues of tram service for those Nottinghamshire residents currently eligible, including those with physical and mental disabilities, also saving money on the consultation? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Creamer. Uh, second question is from Council. Sorry, sorry, I've forgotten. <laughs> sorry, I'm, I'm busy. Uh, talking about something else. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Understood. Understood. Sorry, sorry, Leader. Do you want um, to respond? I'm sure Jim will want an answer. Um, so, um, on the, the specific questions, uh, as I said, we all recognise uh, the significant challenge of cost of living. Um, inflation at 5 6% looks like it will go up for a little while. And if you look at the prices of the most basic items in the shop, they've gone up by significantly more than that. I think we all recognise uh, and understand that more support will be needed. As I said, I think there's a, a huge amount of support uh, that already exists, particularly over the winter months, uh, to help with the various bills and prices, uh, much of which has been extended in terms of eligibility. Obviously, as a council, we support residents through our household support uh, grants and uh, through the provision of things like uh, free school meals. Again, eligibility of those has been extended uh, and now includes the Christmas holidays uh, through to Easter as well. Um, in terms of your specific questions, um, I'm in a very fortunate position that I can go and speak to the PM directly, and I, I do and have. I met the Chancellor on this issue uh, just last week to talk about cost of living prices. You may have seen I, I spoke in a debate in the Commons on this issue too uh, and made a number of suggestions. Uh, I am um, assured that, uh, particularly in advance of the energy price cap probably rising on the 1st of April, government intends to come forward with uh, a, a range of proposals to further support uh, local people. Uh, and on the second question, he'll know uh, and I think it's important that we do go to consultation and ask residents their views uh, of those tram-related uh, concessions and do the right thing by residents. There is a consultation uh, and it will be uh, fully understood and uh, listened to before we make any decisions on that. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. <clears throat> Second question is from Councillor Andre Camilleri concerning parking arrangements at new schools. That's, that's a long term, by the way. Uh, explain what steps the council takes when planning and designing new schools in respect of providing stopping areas for parents or guardians dropping off and picking up their children in motor vehicles. We should always encourage parents to allow their children to walk or cycle to nearby schools wherever this is practical and safe because it's healthier for the children and better for the environment. But would the chairman agree that in some cases motor vehicles do need to be used so we must look at ways to engineer highway solutions outside new schools that minimise disruption for drivers and residents alike. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And uh, I'd like to thank Councillor Camill Camilleri for his question. <clears throat> when considering planning applications, the National Planning Policy Framework, MPPF, it's clear that refusal, refusal should only be recommended on highway grounds if there would be an unacceptable impact on highway safety or where the residual cumulative impact on the road network in terms of congestion would be severe. Within this context, the NPPF recommends that priority should be given to pedestrians and cycle movement. The premise being that the safest and least congested streets are those with the least amount of car movement. Introducing measures which make it easier and more convenient for car users to access and drop off pupils at schools only serves to encourage car usage. This is contrary to the national planning policy requirements as well as the County Council's declaration of a climate emergency and its stated aims of reducing 
CO2 emissions. Notwithstanding this, we are realistic insofar as we expect there will always be parents who wish to drop off their children by car. In recognition of this, the Nottinghamshire Highways Design Guide requires roads serving as the primary point of access to be built with wider carriageways and footpaths uh, than would usually be required for the remainder of the house in development. Developers are encouraged wherever possible to con construct these as though roads and loops uh, as opposed to cul-de-sacs in order to minimise the need for turning and reversing. When formally assessing applications, our focus is very much on creating safe areas free from sig significant car movement and obstructions in the immediate vicinity of the school access. We use traffic calming, uh, traffic calming school keep clear markings and other safety measure, measure, measures to create school safety zones rather than convenient parking for parents. That said, we are aware of the concerns raised by Councillor Camilleri as part of the planning and development of new school developments, as far as, as is practical, uh, uh, we should look for solutions that minimise disruption for drivers and residents. We understand the concerns raised in terms of congestion outside schools at, at peak times, uh, particularly drop-off and pickle. This is not just an issue to be debated when planning applications come to planning or rights of way committees, but has to be, the, the, uh, has to be thought about when a new school is at the inception stage. <clears throat> when this is in, when, with this in mind, I have asked officers to review the processes we currently undertake around designing and planning for new schools to see whether changes can be made to address this issue. The outcome of the review will be reported to the Economic Development and Asset Management Committee on the 19th of April this year. Uh, uh, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Gerling. Councillor Camilleri, do you have a supplementary? Uh, yes, please. yes, thank you for that, uh, uh, Councillor Girling. Uh, it's good to hear that you're going to take some positive steps towards mitigating this problem. Uh, but if you notice the petitions today, uh, at least I think three of them were to do with primary schools and traffic problems outside the school. It makes good sense to design new schools which normally come in big, large blocks of land, design some kind of parking where they can drop off and pick children up. Um, because what we're doing, we're trying to sort it out later after the event. Um, I think we should have some kind of planning policy that Nottinghamshire drives forward where we, where we when, when new plans come have you, forward. Have you got a question, we, Councillor? Want to get, that's a question. Would you look into, would you look into uh, whether or not the planning, planning committee or the planning uh, department can look of adding some kind of policy in so when new schools do come up for development, this is one of the leading parts of the policy. Thank you. Councillor Gurley. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much for that um, very precise question there. I think the, the reality is um, it, it's, it's very easy to say uh, we want people to go there by uh, foot and cycle. The reality, and that there's an assumption that uh, parents take their kids to school then go back home. And there's an assumption that people live really close to the school, um, but actually, we're, we're depending on the planning of where those schools are, it could be quite a distance. And also, parents actually maybe then go, be going on to work. So I fully understand that. And actually, I don't think there'd be any school that's been built in the past that where we don't have issues of, of parents parking uh, dangerously outside schools. And that's why we've purchased those uh, cars with the cameras on to try and uh, reduce that down. So I'm fully. Um, supportive of us looking at a way to resolve this issue, particularly on new builds. Yeah, um, and so I'll be working very closely with the officers to make sure that that's embedded in our thinking, uh, as well as the fact that we need to make provision for people that do go there on uh, on cycle or uh, walk. Because I know, in fact, when I visited Abbey School. Um, even though it wasn't a school day, uh, well, it wasn't during um, them turning up. Uh, it's a very narrow road, a uh, bus route, and I can see why people get extremely anxious and annoyed uh, being stuck in around that school. So it's not really been well thought out, in my view, how, how that went through. So we will be looking at it. We will be looking 
in terms of the petitions on where we can uh, help if we can. It will depend on things like land ownership and things like that, but we will do what we can. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Girling. Uh, Councillor David Martin on the uh, issue about free lateral flow tests. Thank you, Mr Chairman. On the 9th of January 22, the Sunday Times ran a story saying the government was preparing to start charging residents for lateral flow tests for COVID. The story was followed up by the Mail, the Post, broadcasters like Sky and BBC. What impact does the Chair think the removal of free lateral flow tests will have on the continuing fight against COVID in Nottinghamshire? Thank you, Councillor Boyd Elliott, to respond. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you, Councillor Martin, for your question which refers to Sky News amongst other news out outlets. On Sunday the 9th of January, the Sky News website published an article and a video featuring an interview with the Cabinet Minister Nadim Zawawi, who dismissed report in the Sunday Times saying he did not recognise the newspaper stories that lateral flow tests could be limited to care homes, hospitals, schools and people with symptoms. Asked if there were any plans to stop free lateral flow tests, Mr Zawawi said, and I quote, absolutely not. Also on Sky News last week, another cabinet minister, Michael Gove, was asked how long will lateral flow tests be free, to which he, which he replied, as long as we need them. Before going on to say, it is the case that in, in this country, lateral flow tests are free, unlike in many other jurisdictions. They are a vital tool in making sure that we can curb the spread of infection and also that people who need to isolate do so. Chairman, separately, I consulted Nottinghamshire County Council's Director of Public Health, who advised me that he has no information from UK HSA to suggest that there is a plan to withdraw free of charge lateral flow tests. In the last 24 hours, I've read a report from Reuters who claim to have seen a document saying that British health officials may be ready to start charging Britons for COVID-19 tests that are currently free at the end of June. But they add this could be postponed if the virus throws what one official close to health service described as another curveball, perhaps in the form of another variant. On the basis of this information, Chairman, I'm not going to speculate on whether or when free lateral flow tests may cease and what the implications at that stage may be. The overall message I've gleaned from various sources so far is that free tests will continue as long as they are considered to be needed and that this will be assessed over time depending on how the COVID threat develops or recedes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Elliott. Councillor Martin, do you have a supplementary? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for the clarification. And um, would you not agree with me that should onset uh, variants occur, that removing the cost, the, removing the free lateral to, uh, flow tests would uh, inhibit the government's data flow on the new variants and the fight against COVID? Thank you, Councillor Elliott. As I've said in my first answer, I can't speculate, but if we do get another variant, we can lateral flow tests will remain available for all residents. Okay, thank you. Councillor Zadrozny, uh, and concerning the plans to abolish BBC licence fee. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. In, in, the sad, uh, in the week of the sad death of Nottinghamshire's BBC icon, Colin Slater MBE, uh, the Conservative government have announced plans to abolish the BBC licence fee in 2027. Does the leader of Nottinghamshire County Council support this? And what impact does he think this will have in terms of job losses at the BBC and in its supply chain across the county? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Zorzi. Councillor Bradley. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm going to answer this at length, but I'm going to do it uh, as if it were two questions. Because I have to be honest and say, I do find it in slightly poor taste to connect the two uh, matters in the question. Uh, I'm going to first touch on the death of Colin Slater. Um, I was, like many people, deeply saddened to learn about his passing. He had uh, legendary status, really, for many supporters of Notts County Football Club, uh, having reported on almost 3,000 of their games, first for local newspapers and then for Radio Nottingham. Now, County aren't my team. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, across Nottinghamshire, uh, they're the only team I don't follow. <laughs> um, but uh, even for me, uh, Colin was uh, a well-known and much admired local character who contributed a lot to people's memories and experiences of sport around Nottinghamshire. 
Uh, it was affectionately known as Uncle Colin or uh, the voice of Notts County by many fans uh, and his connection and love for the club extended beyond those reporting duties. Uh, for example, he even uh, played a key role in persuading a local businessman to invest to save the club uh, back in uh, as far back as 1965, such as his connection uh, to Nottinghamshire sport and Notts County. So for that and many other reasons, the immense respect for Collins later in the world of football uh, extends way beyond Notts County fans. We've seen uh, tributes to him from supporters of Nottingham Forest, Mansfield Town, other clubs across the country. Um, he also had a direct connection uh, with Nottingham County Council, which people may not know. He was appointed the council's first PR, public relations officer, back in the late 1960s uh, and actually established the department uh, before he joined the BBC in 1968 uh, and reported on the cricket, Trent Bridge, uh, was a PA announcer and uh, later took responsibility for Nottingham County Creek Club's marketing department uh, until the mid-90s. Uh, in 2001, he was recognised for service to radio and the community in Nottinghamshire with an MBE, uh, not only for his contribution uh, to radio, but his work with the FA, his role as Deputy Chairman of the Nottinghamshire Bench of Magistrates. Uh, and in 2015, he had the uh, monumental honour honor of having a tram named after him, uh, an honour afforded only to those local people deemed to have made an exceptional mark on the community. I'm sure councillors will want to uh, join me in saluting his fantastic contribution to Nottinghamshire life and extending our condolences uh, on his passing to all those who knew and, and loved him. Uh, second, and in a, a totally unconnected issue of the PPC licence fee, uh, and I'll reiterate, I, I do think the connecting of these two um, points is, is uh, not ideal. Um, I'll start by saying, um, firstly, the government hasn't announced that it's uh, scrapping the licence fee uh, at all. It's announced uh, and you'll see in the statement in the comments this week, uh, the Secretary of State announced a freeze to the licence fee for the next two years and the start of a consultation uh, about the long-term future of this funding mechanism ahead of the current charter agreement in 2027. Now, the Secretary of State has her own very strong view uh, about this and has expressed that, but in terms of uh, tangible uh, decision and announcement, it is uh, a consultation period. Um, the future of the licence fee has been subject of intense debate for many years, bearing in mind the television industry has changed beyond all recognition since June 1946, when the licence uh, covered a single BBC monochrome channel uh, and cost £2. Uh, many viewers now have the choice of hundreds of television channels, hosted by a variety of platforms, with specialist channels catering for all sorts of individual tastes, uh, funded by advertising, subscription, or both. The market is totally unrecognisable from 1946. Uh, so inevitably you have to question whether the funding mechanism is the right one. I have a very strong personal view. I don't think uh, there will ever really be a need for the county council to take a corporate view. Uh, but I have a personal view, one that I've shared regularly, which is that uh, I think the licence fee has had its day. I don't think it's viable anymore. Back when there were just a handful of channels and uh, we needed public service television to enable people to access basic information, uh, it made absolute perfect sense to fund it in this way. Um, but now there are thousands of options. Increasingly we find young people don't get uh, or don't even access uh, the BBC, they get their news and basic information through other channels um, and get their media content elsewhere. You have to consider um, what is the right option. It's only uh, right with so much choice and variety. Millions of people now spending their money on subscription services, Netflix, Now TV, uh, widely accepted part of our lives. It doesn't seem right or viable to me to continue to subsidise uh, the media. As I say, that is just my personal view. That doesn't mean, for the record, that I want the BBC to disappear. In fact, I'm confident large parts of it would compete incredibly well in an international market. Those who believe that the BPC is a beacon of British creativity uh, and is respected around the world, as I do, should take comfort then that if they are freed from the licence fee and they're able to compete globally, you're not telling me they couldn't find a market to replace funding from uh, millions in the UK who might choose not to pay a BBC subscription from a global market of six billion people who hold the BBC in very high regard. They could in my view, uh, and as I said, my belief is that they absolutely should. But a poll carried out just over a year ago by Comrades found that nearly two out of three Britons believe the current licence fee uh, should be abolished. And whilst I would acknowledge that different polls produce different outcomes, um, I think it's safe to say there's been a growing feeling among the public that the licence fee <laughs> should be considered. It is, of course, another factor in the cost of living uh, that Councillor DeJosny highlights later today, although that cost now won't uh, increase for the next two years as a result of government's announcement this week. Uh, Councillor Zajosi made the connection with jobs in Nottinghamshire and I advise him that sadly those jobs are under threat <coughs> under the existing licence fee model because those at the top of the BBC have chosen not to continue to fund the local news services to the same extent. Many of those staff at local BBC news and radio services are facing an uncertain future, an issue quite separate from the licence fee decision which if it were to be scrapped wouldn't be implemented 
for another six years. I also have a personal view on this, and again, one that I've expressed uh, many times, one that I think many of my constituents share, which is that these jobs for local news and reporting services should be a much higher priority for the BBC than they currently seem to be, and that as a public service broadcaster, uh, they should be protecting those local news services at the expense of uh, multi-million pound salaries for high-profile uh, presenters, at the expense of 100 million pounds diversity programmes. I was shocked this week to hear that the top diversity director at the BBC is on 267,000 a year for a three-day week, which is quite incredible. When there seems to be no uh, local, no money for local reporters in regional news services, where so many local residents um, want to access the news from their area, not just the national uh, information. But these are the kind of areas where I think the service would benefit from being forced to compete in the wider market and having to make better decisions about how it spends its money. Again, just my personal view, uh, which I will no doubt feed into that national consultation progress. So in summary, the Secretary of State for Digital, Cultural, Media and Sport is perfectly entitled, even obliged, to review the necessity for the licence fee. And at the end of the current charter, uh, it's due in 2027. She's right to want to give the BBC uh, as much time as possible to adapt their model if that's necessary and to prepare for that 2027 deadline. So it's quite right and fair that the conversation happens as soon as possible. Ultimately, that's a matter to resolve <coughs> at national level and doesn't come within the policymaking power of Nottinghamshire County Council. Hence, me sharing a personal view. I don't see uh, a need, certainly at this time, for the council to have a corporate view. I'm sure this will be more widely debated in Parliament. And I'm sure that will happen at great length and in great detail over the coming months. Thank you, Chairman. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Dudley. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Dudley? Do, Chair. You'll be pleased to know it's briefer than the leader's answer. Uh, ben, thank you for that. I, I, it wasn't my intention to uh, really debate the merits or not of the BBC as a whole, otherwise I'd be studying here talking about the two Ronnies and David Attenborough and Steptoe and Son, uh, Only Falls and Horses, and, and the Question Time and Panorama and the wealth of things that is given to our country uh, longer than that. It wasn't even... My, uh, um, uh, Can we move intention. to a question, Councillor, please? Chairman, it was a very lengthy answer, and I, I need to just contextualise. It wasn't even my intention to talk about the specifics of the fee, because obviously BBC is still cheaper than a Netflix subscription, um, etc. And I think while it's f fashionable to have a pop at the uh, BBC, I think we... Uh, need to raise the vital service that it provided during COVID, where uh, the press conferences were out on a daily basis. Where the Councillor, BBC I'm still became waiting for your our, question. Where the BBC became our schools, Mr Chairman. Councillor Bradley, just a cursory look at your social media. It's only 48 hours since you, you published uh, your interview with the BBC East Midlands about pavement parking, and then five days ago, one about stalking. I didn't go any further back, otherwise I'd be the stalker. Um, Mr Chairman... Um, I think uh, the, the question is that um, we know that in Nottinghamshire it will affect 130 people, not just uh, the, the reporters, etc., but also further into the supply chain. And just because the people don't like what it says, it doesn't mean you should scrap it. So would you agree with me that the country would be poorer without a form of the BBC and that the independence of the BBC um, means that this council and the country is much more transparent? And do you agree with me that there are more cost-effective ways, subscription ways, and, and this, uh, that the country should look at all options so that it isn't a burden on the taxpayer, but that we can continue to provide that service? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. I'm really grateful that the Council of Justice agrees with the government's approach to consult on all of the various options uh, around the licence fee, which is what um, the Secretary of State announced earlier this week. There will be, as I say, a, a long and detailed conversation. He'll be pleased that he's picked on an issue that I obviously have a strong view about, hence my uh, lengthy answer. But um, all views uh, and options will be considered. Uh, I do agree that the country will be poorer without uh, the BBC, but I don't um, believe that it needs to continue uh, in the same form of funding uh, as currently uh, exists. And I think, as I've said in my previous answer, uh, there is a strong uh, and varied market for media, for news and for everything else. And I uh, believe strongly that BBC would compete very well in that market. Uh, and in relation to the local jobs, um, unfortunately, as I said in my previous answer, those jobs are at threat under the current licence fee model, not least because so many millions of people have chosen not to uh, continue to pay the licence fee and instead just not to watch <coughs> the BBC. So it's not uh, sustainable from that perspective. Um, but as I say, uh, we will consult on it on a national level uh, all those options will be considered and in due course we'll, uh, we'll find an answer that suits as many people as possible, I'm sure. Thank you, Councillor Bradley. 
I call upon uh, Councillor Lee Walters regarding the implementation of the Highways Review. Thank you, Chairman. On Friday, the 14th of January 2022, Via East Midlands carried out some work on Brookside in Hucknall. Workers chucked some Via Fix into a few holes and drove off. This work was described by residents as an embarrassment as it went viral on social media. Does the chairman agree with me that the quality of work undertaken by Via East Midlands on Nottinghamshire's broken roads and pavements is the single biggest reputational risk to this council? When will the recommendations of the Highways Review published at the Transport and Environment Committee on the 17th of November finally be implemented? Thank you. Councillor Clark. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. Uh, you may well remember that uh, last year I did actually recount uh, a story of me uh, visiting Titchfield Park in uh, Hutnell. Uh, and uh, very nice uh, Titchfield Park is too. And in fact, uh, Councillor Wilmot will uh, bear testament to the fact that I was there because I met him when I was in the park. The reason I mention that, Mr Chairman, is because after I'd finished that visit, I thought, well, I'm not very far from Brookside. I'm going to nip round the corner and have a look at Brookside, middle of last year, which I did. And it was in a very poor state. And I decided then we need to put this into the improvement program for next year because it needs doing. And I saw that last year. So I've now seen the emergency repair work that was carried out on Friday, as uh, Councillor Waters mentioned, and it was not acceptable. In some cases, it is necessary to carry out emergency repairs to make the highway safe before our operatives return to carry out more extensive repairs. But in this case, the work carried out by a subcontractor was unsatisfactory, even as a temporary measure. And in fact, they, well, at the time, they undertook to redo the work uh, at their own expense. However, I, I hope, because I've seen uh, the photographs, uh, that uh, Councillor Waters and others have seen the photographs of now the newly repaired uh, Brookside of the large scale patches, which are an immense improvement on the uh, condition of Brookside at the moment. The County Council, as everybody knows, I'm sure, has recently carried out a highways review where it was agreed as a matter of policy that we would be focusing on the local estate roads, carrying out more extensive repairs and resurfacing roads that are particularly uh, poor condition. Brookside, as I have just mentioned, and I've had now had it to confirm just to check to be sure, it is scheduled. Uh, in this forthcoming year uh, for the further work to be carried out uh, so that uh, the end result will be far more satisfactory for local residents and the road users when completed. The condition of our roads and pavements uh, is indeed a, a reputational risk to this council and that's why we are working a lot harder uh, than our predecessors to address it. The incoming Conservative administration inherited a huge backlog of road repairs in 2017. A problem we have said will take a long time to put right because there are so many other competing demands on our budget at this time. Nevertheless, in recognition of that, we invested an extra £24 million. Mr Chairman, an extra £24 million in highways maintenance between 2018 and 2021, and we will be investing heavily again during this administration to ensure that the outcomes of the Highways Review can be turned into action. As I demonstrated through the cross-party review process, I repeat again the cross-party review process. I don't know if is it can, is Councillor Smith telling Mr. Wal uh, Councillor Walters what to say next. Uh, so, 
I'm willing to work with councillors of all political persuasions across Nottinghamshire to address the issues raised by local residents and road users. A task of this size can only be tackled by working together, that cross-party bit, Mr Chairman, uh, in the interests of our residents, rather than playing politics in the media with outrageously misleading press releases repeated in the media, claiming that the independents forced this council. <laughs> There's no shame. There's no shame. The claim that the independents forced this council to undertake a review. What did we say, Mr Chairman, in the run-up to the election that the roads were probably the most important and talked about aspect of all the election issues and we undertook then before the election we need to get before that review. Before was even elected. What, what was one of the first actions that this administration took, Mr Chairman? Point of order, Chair. Point of order. What is your point of order? My point of order, Chair, is could we keep the answer to an answer and not a political broadcast? Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Martin, Councillor Martin, that is not the decision for you to make. It's a decision for the Chair to make. <laughs> Thank you, Chairman. Well, that's a bit rich, considering the, uh, what they've just said in the media about uh, and political statements. Anyway, uh, as I was uh, about to say, one of the very first actions of this administration and the very first meeting of this council, only a couple of weeks after the elections, what did we do? Set it we up. announced that we were undertaking a review of the highways. If that's called forcing us, well, yeah, yes. Oh, really? Oh, for highlighting. Yes, yeah, yeah. For highlighting. Thank you for coming up with the idea where you weren't here. Anyway, just to uh, to finish off, Mr. Chairman, because I realise you're looking at your watch and lunch is pressing. At the forthcoming Transport and Environment Committee on the 9th of February, officers will be updating my committee on the progress against the agreed highways review actions including our ambitious multi-year programme of highways repairs. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Clark. <coughs> Councillor Waters, do you have a supplementary? Thank you, Chairman. Outside of Council, in my role, I have a mantra of my team who I manage of get it right first time. But anyway, um, can I thank Councillor Clark for acknowledging the problems <coughs> on Brookside I didn't hear an apology. I heard a lot of blame of a previous administration. I thought the previous administration was a conservative administration. Um, I welcome the fact that Brookside will be revisited and your comments for resurfacing it. Do you have a question, Councillor Waters? Program. I do. I'm, this Can you move to it? Question. I am. The job on Brookside is common across Ashfield. It is not good enough. In your comments... You blame the subcontractors for the bodge job. Would you agree to a route and branch <coughs> review of your use of subcontractors? And do you accept that blaming subbies is like Boris Johnson blaming caterers for downing street parties? <laughs> no apology for, for lying to the Sh press. Mr Councillor Clark. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Well, uh, yes, I... I uh, I was uh, waiting for the uh, apology for the outrageous misleading of the press, but I th think that would come. Um, but uh, perhaps, uh, well, it's nice to uh, hear that presumably they have actually read the recommendations of the review panel because the recommendation of the review panel referred specifically to looking at the relationship with subcontractors and how we operate with subcontractors. So... That particular aspect oh, it is fully answered. Uh, it's amazing how easy it is to push it to not just an open door, but where actions have already been taken and then claiming that they want something to be done when we're already doing it. Thank you, yeah, Chair. Yeah.
Thank you, Councillor Clark. I'll take one more question before we break for lunch, uh, and then we will have uh, a further seven questions left. Um, at the moment, we have uh, 23 minutes left. <coughs> Councillor Michelle Walsh, regarding the impact of COVID on progress and mental health of children. Uh, yes, this is a question to the Chairman of Children and Young People's Committee. Can the Chair of the Children and Young People's Committee outline what actions are going to be undertaken to assess and measure the level of impact of COVID-19 has had and continues to have on Nottinghamshire's children and young people, specifically in terms of their progress and mental health? Thank you. Councillor Taylor to respond. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Welsh, for your question. Regarding the impact COVID-19 has had on Nottinghamshire's children and young people, your question reads at the end, specifically in terms of their progress and mental health. So it's not absolutely clear what you mean by progress, but I've assumed that you're referring to educational progress and then separately to mental health. So on that basis, I will answer the question in two parts. Regarding educational progress, we recognise that children and young people have had their education interrupted by repeated closures and moves to remote learning. Schools have developed new ways of working with pupils online, which have really helped some students. In addition, there has been significant investment in catch-up programmes for those pupils who are vulnerable. Whilst primary statutory testing was cancelled, arrangements for statutory GCSE and A-levels were amended and students received outcomes which were determined by their teachers who know their students best. We don't yet have any data to make a proper analysis of educational outcomes or progress, and we won't have this for some time, so it is too early to draw conclusions. The Council itself is ultimately no longer responsible for educational outcomes. This is now a matter for school head teachers and governing bodies, ultimately overseen by the Regional Schools Commissioner and the Education and Skills Funding Agency, ESFA. What we can say is that Ofsted have resumed their inspections of schools in Nottinghamshire, with the early indications being that our schools continue to deliver a good or better quality of education. So moving to mental health for children and young people. Since the outbreak of COVID, Colleagues working across both the Not Nottingham City and Nottinghamshire County Councils with colleagues from health services have taken a national leading role in developing resources for schools to use in supporting children's mental health. This began when children were being educated at home during lockdown and then we supported their well-being as they returned to school and now we continue to do this as children and staff learn to live with a changed learning environment in schools over the longer term. Children's well-being has quite rightly received even greater focus in schools than was the case pre-COVID. Schools continue to be the best place to assess the impact COVID has had on their pupils' mental health. And local authority services working in partnership with health colleagues continue to support schools in assessing pupils' mental health needs and in designing their school environment so that it's conducive to positive mental health and in accessing services where this is needed. Examples of this work include the creation of the Not Alone website, the provision of training to senior mental health leads in schools and the ongoing development of the mental health in schools teams. The Director of Public Health team is currently drafting the scope of a COVID-19 impact assessment focusing on health and well-being and the effect on inequalities in particular. The scope will be agreed by the 1st of February and children and young people's mental health is expected to be a part. The delivery date for this part of the impact assessment is yet to be confirmed and is subject to the capacity of Nottinghamshire County Council and partners. It will link closely with any COVID impact work being done by partners such as the Nottingham and Nottinghamshire Integrated Care System. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Do you have a supplementary, Councillor Welsh? Uh, yes, I do. I'll try and do it as quick as possible as well. Yes? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, 
I am concerned the new normal will not want to understand the full impact of children and people during the pandemic. I think that's a natural response to such a traumatic period. But also, but ultimately, I think that also be a mistake and a missed opportunity. I don't agree that there isn't the data there already that is signifying the impact that it's having on children. Councillor Wells, people. do you have a question, please? I do have it. This is pertinent to the question, Chair. Um, so if you look at the latest NHS mental health um, data, for example, Nottingham and Nottinghamshire are failing below national standards on five key mental health indicators. I'll go straight to the um, ultimate question, though. Would the Chair therefore commit to doing more on the issue and in particular to raise the need for more future partnership working by accepting a proposal to host a summit with partner organisations in health, education, charities and other child and youth services, the purpose of which is to co-produce and agree a Nottinghamshire-wide COVID-19 recovery action plan for children and young people of Nottinghamshire for the future of Nottinghamshire. Thank you. Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chairman. I must admit, when I was anticipating what a supplementary question might be, um, I suppose my question for Councillor Welsh would have been whether we were considering the impact on all children or perhaps on the most vulnerable children. So in my thinking, I had looked to the committee reports, a committee on which Councillor Welsh sits. And in June of last year, we received a child poverty update, which included reference to the themes that she's asked about today. In November of last year, we received a further child poverty and impact of COVID report. And we also received a local transformation plan for the children and young people's emotional and mental health report. So the committee on which Councillor Welsh sits has received significant reports in the course of the last six months. And I know from questioning at the committee, Councillor Welsh was certainly not sleeping through those. So I would make the point that work has been undertaken. Work is ongoing and work will continue on both measuring outcomes. But the reports do make explicit that whilst Councillor Welsh seems to be sourcing data from somewhere, that the data which is out in official national reporting terms goes back to 2018 because there is always a lag on reporting. But the reports made very specific reference to our ongoing monitoring of mental health support teams in schools, education recovery, and the existing Nottinghamshire and Notty Nottingham City wellbeing for... Point of order, Chair. I'm not sure where the answer to the question. I specifically asked whether she would accept some cross-party right. work in introducing a summit across the County Council. So she's not... Can, can, she can you not interrupt question, uh, the Speaker while they're responding? Please, Councillor Wells. point of order, Chair. And with just a little more, thank you, Chair, with just a little more patience, Councillor Welsh would have heard me re read from the report of November that there is an existing Nottinghamshire and Nottingham City Wellbeing for Education Recovery Consortium who is already working on the sort of project that Councillor Welsh clearly wants to pretend in this chamber today she has attempted to instigate. The work is in play, the work will continue. We are already doing it. Thank well you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. <laughs> Colleagues, we will now adjourn for lunch. Um, we are a little bit past one, but could I ask you to be back in the chamber for two? Yeah. And we have uh, 15 minutes left on questions.